couple of years, but I'd also would have done bad with it, you know? Yeah. You get to a certain point, you get to a certain age where things like click for you and you feel like your opinions can exist without going against other people's opinions, you know? Like, how often, Jeremy, do you see me quote tweet anyone else's opinion? Yeah. <laughs> Never. That's, I, don't, I don't either. I'm just like, nope. Even if I, like, I saw Satin and Meltzer were being petty today and, like, it would have been easy to quote tweet that stuff. It's like, you know, not even going to try it, especially those two. But, yeah, anybody else, I'm just like, nah. If I want to respond, I'll just message or I just won't say shit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because really, what, so what's the the positive outcome? Okay, I get some more followers. Is that even a good thing? Probably. No. You I know, so it's followers. like, exactly. So it's, it's difficult. I, I, wish, um, I wish everyone would unfollow me. Yeah, I get that. That's what Patreon's become a really good tool for me because it's just like the ultimate just like bubble that we've built for ourselves. And I can just like rant away and yeah. <laughs> without having to worry about, you know, someone. Because the worst shit is when like someone will tweet a take and then it'll be like someone screenshots that take. It's like, look at this clown. It's like, oh, fuck, man. I never want to be the clown in the screenshot, you know? I never want to do that. Okay. Joseph, what's the big match you're reviewing? Yeah, uh, would it be uh, on the Unbreakable match? Is that the, I would say that's the big match. That's yeah. the big match? Okay. I would say so. All right. I just needed a thumbnail for for this. Uh, JJ resubscribing six months. Yes, halfway to one year on Twitch. We've been that's stupid. Wow, that's tremendous. Why'd they let us do this? Why'd they give us this? We're actually quite good at it. All right. We all believe it or not, quite good at it. Did you watch the uh, the uh, Riley Walker ask how was the NWA pay per view? Did you watch it, Joseph? <laughs> no, absolutely not. I was I was absolutely just baffled at what they did though. I mean, I, I saw one of Trevor's promos and I thought, you know what? Honestly, at this point, just put the belt on Trevor Murdoch. And then I, I thought they're not gonna like I felt like they weren't gonna beat him clean, and I was correct in the worst way to be correct ever. Like I saw the finish and was like, oh man, it's just so out of date yeah, and it's. Yeah. It's just a shame. It's a real shame because it doesn't have to be this way, but we've covered that Dude, you know, the, ad nauseum. <laughs> the, way, the way JR subscribing for five months. JR, why don't you have a, a – somebody should gift you a sub as a as a yeah. former uh, – that's the word I'm looking for. Former just person who's been on this channel. Yeah, know. former guest. Yeah, Shoot guest. Pal. There you go. Guest. Yeah. I don't know. I can't speak words. Um, nope, we, we have lost. We've lost. We're not talking about hockey. Refuse. Absolutely refuse. Just the same way I assume Joseph refuses to talk about basketball. We're not doing that shit here. Sports are stupid. That's my conclusion. Well, I'm just, I'll say this much about the Sixers. I'm glad we rallied enough that it wasn't like, it was more frustrating than like, we actually just embarrassed ourselves. Does that make sense? I, I can deal with heart. It's annoying, but I can, at least we, at least we rallied and we tried at the end of the game. I feel like from a casual perspective, and again, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, if you want to talk about the Sixers, that's fine. I, I refuse to talk about the Avs. Um, but you've got to be a little bit encouraged, yes, with the rallying, and two, um, that like they played well in the second half, and it seemed like they just got blitzed in the first half, had the wrong game plan, and then in the second half they made the adjustments, figured it out. Like you got to feel a little bit positive about that going forward. Yes, that as well as the fact that Embiid looked actually like yes. Embiid, yeah. which is very positive. I was, I was... It's just what you said, mate. You, you bang on. We had the wrong. We had the wrong approach. We were a little bit flat out of the blocks, and they shot the ball incredibly well from free. So yeah. it's like, yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. Obviously, it, it puts a lot of pressure on the next game, but I'm not going to worry about that now because um, it could do bad things to my heart rate. Yes. And uh, now. I do want to talk about forward to review matches here because it is just just gone five pm Eastern time. Um, why did we like pretend there was any chance that Logan Paul for Lavelle was going to be interesting? <laughs> why did we do that? Because like when I was watching it, I was like, oh yeah, this is exactly what this fight would obviously look like. Why did I pretend in my head that it could be fun? Yeah, I was I was watching it with uh, with the EP, and she's like, after the first round, she's just like, is this what it's going to be? I was like, yeah, <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> yeah. like. I told her, I was like, I, I'm pretty sure, like, Floyd's just going to wait until Logan just, like, gasses him out. I thought I really thought Floyd was going to knock him out, like, the 6th or the 7th. Because uh, yeah. I thought Logan, and, like, he was dead, dead fucking tired uh, in those late rounds. And Floyd just, like, especially in the 8th, like, he didn't even, like, pretend to try to, like, knock him out mm-hmm. or anything. I, but, yeah, it was exactly, 
I loved when Floyd was just like walking forward with his hands up, just like, all right, come on, hit me and wear yourself out. Like it was the right approach, I thought, for Floyd. I just don't know. I mean, he's he's forty four. Like Logan's a big yeah. dude. Maybe just wouldn't go down and everything. But that eighth round, I was just like, man, like you couldn't even like try to knock him out and everything. So this is the thing is like I think we all had this weird idea that, and I don't know why we did this because he's taught us many times he doesn't care. I think we always like, oh man, Pride's going to force Floyd to try and get the finish. Yeah. It's like Floyd just doesn't give a shit, nah, does he? He, he really doesn't. But I will say, I do think Floyd was legit, like, some, like somewhat rattled at himself that he couldn't finish the fight. He looked legit upset in the post fight. Like, I, I know people are going to laugh at that because he made 20 million, or a lot more than that, a lot of million dollars. But his interview was very much, you know, when he was talking about, like, yeah, I'm getting a little bit old, you know. He's a big kid, he's not as bad as I thought. Like, he did seem a little bit surprised that he didn't. Because when it was like fifth round, it was like, yeah, he's definitely getting him out of there. And as you said, by the eighth, it was like he was content. So it was an awful event, a terrible spectacle. Um, I don't know how you could ever do something like that again. I, I really don't. I mean, the thing of it is, Mayweather, like the reason these fights work is because everyone agrees Mayweather's a guy that's not going to knock anyone out in the first round. If you did, you know, if you did golovkin versus a pole brother people like well, i'm just gonna buy this for a slaughter it's a very different kind of appeal yeah floyd's a pure boxer so it's different but the issue with that is when it actually comes time to watch the fight floyd doesn't give a shit about making you happy with a big knockout when he couldn't get you he's just like okay cool i'm, I'm chill so so there's that uh, it did suck and i want to apologize to everyone that actually had to listen to us talk about it a week ago because it was very bad <laughs> now they just um, listen to us talk about the review yeah, well, you know, it was worth putting a bow on these things, Jeremy. We have many hours to fill talking about this stuff. Um, folks, it is the second one match Monday. We have a new set of matches. I tweeted them out. I put them on the Patreon. I did all of the above. Um, it's going up on the main site right now. So there you go. You can, I mean, you're already kind of here, but if yep. you're not here and you're about to join us, it'll be up on the uh, main Fightful. So for people that do not know, this is a show that is um, Iron Cracker Jack. You should be drunk off the Clippers this weekend. They, they, that could be a pivotal win that brings them together. And I know I'm not the guy you want to hear say that because every time I say they're going to do well, they lose. But it does feel like now is the time, right? Now is the time to really come together and, and, and kick on. We, we will see that. Uh, the way this works, folks, is that we have a five-match card sort of takeover style. I try and get some variety on here, which as we go through this one, you'll quickly realise... We are definitely not short on variety. Um, we have four suggestions from either Twitch subscribers or, or patrons. I had the fifth match, and then I go through with a fine tooth comb, watch all the matches a couple of times, you know, make some notes, and we we review it effectively. Jeremy will go off memory if he remembers the match. If not, he'll say, sounded good or never seen it. <laughs> One or the other. Um, that's how it works. I'll be talking with the chat throughout as I review each match. And obviously, if you guys watch them, post away in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of respond and all that good stuff so that is what we're doing here today this is one of the more formal shows we do in the sense that i may miss stuff in the chat folks i do apologize i have many notes to get through um so jeremy i think you will have fond memories of our first match which is randy orton luke harper elimination chamber 2017 which is from our pal tim taxel and one of the great brothers in our community, and he sent this a while back, so I'm glad we get to it on the second card. Why am I supposed to have fond memories of this? Well, it's this recent, and like I remember we talked about that kind of run for Harper on SmackDown. Like it's you know, it's not saying that's a, a distant memory, right? My me- so, one, my memory sucks. Two, okay. m- most of the recent stuff I have no memory of because it's not memorable. Fair. This is fair. <laughs> this is very fair. But I think this is because this, this is a kind of a unique time. So paint the picture, folks. Um, my God. What was that? That was a race car, I think. <laughs> Holy shit. I, I thought it was a open. sound effect on our, on the channel. I was like, when did this when did this sound effect <laughs> happen on loud. our Twitch channel? <laughs> it's 10 o'clock. That's very loud, unnecessarily <laughs> so. Um, okay. To paint the picture, folks, uh, these two guys have been linked in this Bray Wyatt story for about four months. The angle is such... Um, uh, Randall is, you know, he's kind of infiltrating the Wyatt family and Harper, I'm going to call him Brody a lot, I apologise, folks, but, you know, he's he doesn't trust Randy. He's basically the, the idea, I watched the video back before and was trying to remember what was going on. I remember they dropped the belts to the, the American Alpha men 
Um, and effectively, Bray Wyatt has picked uh, Randy over Luke. But what's interesting is I watched this, Jeremy. The Bray Wyatt character that was a cult leader. I don't know if I liked it at the time. I miss it after seeing the stuff he's done since. So I have to be honest. Yeah. It's a lot more grounded in the wrestling kind of narratives, you know? Like, it's a lot easier for me to just sort of follow along. Um, yeah, it's better. Would you agree on that, Mr. It's better, right? The cult leader, Bray? Has to be. I mean, it's better because, like, he actually... It was more, it was more fleshed out, and he yeah. wasn't as, like, hampered by everything that they've done to him with this with this current character, which... Is clearly not his his vision. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, <laughs> Tank says Joe's in the studio with Billy Corgan right now. Fuck. Sounds like Frit. Oh man. Okay. That sucks. It's, I'm sorry, it's not buddy. a place I'd like to be. Um, <laughs> now, what's interesting here is that Alton is like the de facto heel, based on what I just said. But like. Everyone knows he's going to be going babyface because everyone knows he's eventually going to work Bray. So you have this weird dynamic where Luke is correct to not trust Randy and therefore is the babyface because Bray has turned on him. But we also don't dislike Randy for betraying Bray eventually because Bray is an asshole. Layers, folks. That's what I'm talking about. Layers. The other thing that's weird about this match is if I say it to you and you just imagine it in your head, um, you kind of think of it as like, you know, pure wrestler versus monster. Randy Orton is very tall. Very, very, very tall man, and he's basically the same size as Brody. Because of course, right? Randy's huge. So you have an interesting matchup just stylistically, and, and it allows them to work 50 50 and not be stuck with a format as Randy tries to be the heel. With that comes good and bad in terms of the latter part of Randy being the heel. I will get into that as we go. Now, one of my favourite things about Brody Lee, folks, as a performer, in a world of big men being able to do cool moves, because that very much is the era we're in, I always thought he had such striking ability to use his eyes as, as a guy who's when he's selling whether it's on offense or, or just you know he's a, a near fall whatever it may be he always had those piercing eyes Brody right you look at that and the Derby would do a great job of catching them on those close-ups they teach everyone to look for and very few guys really do anything with them Brody it was really one of the striking things of his performance this is I always go back to this match as like the crown jewel in that regard like it's, he, that is the best use of it because he's a baby face, basically, and he's able to really, really have fun with it. But there's this sense that he's just excited to finally get to beat up Randy Orton. By contrast, Randy is, like, very cautious. Now, why is why is that? What sense does that make? He's an 18 million time champion. Well, Jeremy Lambert, Randy knows that Brody's the only one that realises he's playing Bray. Right? So you have this mind game that actually ages well when you watch it back now, knowing where the angle goes. He's cautious of Luke because he knows Luke's a step ahead of him. It's good stuff, very simple stuff, but it's good stuff, nonetheless. So, they have these kind of tight lockups, and they, they split every time. And you have that contrast and tone and all that good stuff. One's rearing to go, the other one's cautious. You know, and to match that, Randy bows after like a spot or two, and that kind of deal. Harper's chasing them around the ring. That, that's the that's the, that's the simple setup with Luke as, as the baby face. Um, it makes sense for the shine, obviously. Harper's kicking ass at ringside. All good stuff. Then... In one of the more unique cut off spots I've seen in my time, Jeremy Lambert. Luke Harper heads up top and Randy just punches him in the face and Luke takes a bump to the to the apron and it is awesome. It, it, it's like such a nothing spot and it's one of those great examples of and Randy's obviously a master, but Brody's right there with him, man. Like if you do something well, the simplest shit can be good. You know? Like it's literally a punch to the apron and Brody takes it so hard with such a thump that it, it gets over and the people react to it. Now, here's where the match gets somewhat frustrating for me, as much as I like it. And this is, what, I think if we did a lot of Randy matches, guys, you'd see this as a common trend for me personally. So Randy gets control and, you know, he hits his pose, which is this kind of neat moment of, like, finally, exhale, right? right? The guy's not after it. Exactly. The guy's not after it anymore. I can, you know, I can, I can chill a little bit. And he goes to work. And he does the awesome back suplex on the, on the announce table, what he nearly killed one of the Singh brothers with, which we all love. And then he grabs a hold. And now look, folks, I am not a believer in these cliche narratives that you hear from every wrestling media man about headlocks and all that stuff. However, it has been a common issue for Randy that sometimes, like, he just doesn't have any ideas as to what he's going to do when he's in control. Like, he just grabs a hold, and he'll wait. He'll wait for the people to be with it. The issue with that is that while we're about to realise that Brody gets over with the people, and that's a beautiful thing, 
going into the match, this is a very casual WWE audience that frankly would rather cheer Randy Orton. So you end up in a situation where Randy's got a headlock and the people are just sort of like, boo, they're just like, they're just bored. They're not, they're not trying to get Harper up, right? They're just trying to sort of, you know, get Randy to do something. And when Randy gets that reaction, he says, okay, I'm going to sit in this hole because that's what he does. Exactly right, Jeremy. Um, he does sometimes he sort of twists it a bit as well. He does that. And there you go. That's good. That's exactly right. Now, <laughs> someone's never seen our show. They'd be like, what is, is Jeremy like translating? What's he doing? What's he doing? I don't know, folks. I don't know what he's doing. Now, here, look, here's the situation. Okay. I am a fan of Randy Orton, but this is a common thing. Um, in which he does a heat segment in where really there is very little heat. He's just sort of stalling and doing stuff. If you asked him, he would probably explain it to you as the RKO is to the head, I do a headlock, to which I'd say, bullshit. Now, um, finally, Hart makes a comeback and things very, very swiftly improve because he is awesome. Of course, this rolls, he does some very cool shit. He does that awesome big boot he used to do, Jerry. Remember the one where he drops to a knee off his own? Just tremendous. He's just great, right? He then does a dive to the floor where they, they tease it once. Randy's ahead of it, and he, you know, he just he gets through it and does it anyway. It's all very good stuff. Um, and then they basically just start trading their call to shit, which is where you realise that like, Randy can do this stuff and be absolutely at home doing it. Like he's, you know, he's he's so skillful that in this sort of setup, he's not even out of his depth. It's just like you need to bring it out of him sometimes. Um, he does like a power slam on the floor, and it's just. You know, he's one of the top power slam guys ever, right, Jeremy? you got to say, like, Dustin's up there. I think Joe's one's pretty cool where he nearly kills everyone with it. <laughs> but, like, Randy's, like, you know, he's a, he's an elite power slam guy. Then he does the best move in wrestling, which, of course, is the superplex. Guys, imagine what I'm telling you here. Randy Orton's superplex in Brody Lee. I mean, it looks as awesome as it sounds. It is a dramatic move. Guys of that size, it is awesome. Um, you know, and now they're back to square one, they trade some strikes, and there's this this running theme where Harper is always avoiding the RKO. He never lets him set up, or he cuts it off at the last minute. On one time, he, like, super kicks when Randy's about to go for it. Randy does this sell, folks. He does it on a, after a super kick here. He does this sell where he, like, stands on his ankle. That may make no sense to you. What I mean is, he does this thing where he suggests that his legs are so staggered and unstable that he can't even stand up right on his feet. He's, like bending his feet over and standing his ankle and wobbling around. It's tremendous. It's one of his best things that very, very few guys I've seen pull it off. Randy pulls it off. So he does that deal, um, eats another one, kicks out two, and Harper then does an awesome powerbomb, um, and again counters the RKO, avoids it along the way. And at this point, the match is basically framed as, holy shit, you know, Harper is in all of his best stuff, and Randy's just surviving him, basically. And they even seem to capture an idea that, like, or doing all these moves is exhausted, Brody, too. Like, he's, he's very much a case of he's, he really should have won the big one by now, but Randy's just so damn resilient, he's getting through it. This results in them both kneeling down, they're, they're trading strikes, that kind of idea. Um, and, it, and it's framed as though Harper is spent, but Randy is rocked, effectively. And they fight upright, slowly. Strike, strike, they're both building their base again up. And then eventually... Harper gets a little bit of momentum, goes for the discus. You may remember this finish, Jeremy. He goes for the discus, and Randy blocks it, spins RKO. And it's the idea that after trying to land the RKO three or four times, Randy had to counter. He had to wait for Luke to go first, you know, and then he could catch it. And the finish is very much presented as though Harper had him and just got caught by the RKO. Orton's stylistic choices in terms of what he does in controlled matches, they are not always the most exciting the most daring, the most creative. And if I was rating the match on a sort of a wider scale, I would knock it for that. I would criticise it for the fact that when he's in control, the match is somewhat uninteresting. However, at the end of this match, Randy has won clean with his finish, and all the people can think about is, holy shit, Luke Harper just arrived. In that sense, it's very hard for me, even though I just said all those things, to criticise Randy, because what did he really do? He wrestled a match that was so, like... I don't want to say dry or dull, but it, he wrestled a match that was so basic and within himself, effectively, that as the heel, he positioned Harper to be the complete and utter headline maker. Now, do I think that couldn't have been done with him working an arm? Like, for example, okay, what if Randy had worked the arm for the whole match, and then when he blocked the discus, he'd add even more depth to it? You know, like, Luke could have clutched his arm, okay. But do I think that makes it a better match? Yes. But at the end of the day, Randy's objective here was win 
And don't hurt yourself because you're going to WrestleMania for a major match. Obviously, we know what that match, major match ended up being. Shame. Not really thought of Bray's. Well, that was just an absolute disgrace of a you know kind of creation. But that was his job. Go out, win. Don't hurt yourself, but try and make Harper. Now, why they were trying to make Harper, we have no clue because they did nothing with it. But nonetheless, he did do that because when, again, God bless you, so we all love Brody. When people were going through their favourite Brody matches in WWE, this one came up very often. And watching it today, he's not a classic match. He's not a masterpiece. He is a very much a clear attempt and successful one at that at making Luke Harper a top guy. We all know what came of it afterwards, and that's a shame. We can't rewrite history, unfortunately. But on this night, Randy Orton very much did his job. It is a very neat, cool little match. Jeremy, do you remember? I know you remember this time. Cause I remember we talked about Lemp from Brody Past, unfortunately. But like this was a this is one people talk about a lot, right? As one of his like shining moments as a singles guy. Do I remember the intricacies of this match? No. Um, do I remember like this whole storyline and everything? Yeah, because as we as you mentioned, like this was this was kind of Brody's like big big run in WWE almost like the bludgeon brothers stuff sure but you know when he got to work with bray when he got to work with randy like that's when people saw him as that that breakout kind of guy i do remember like bits and pieces of this match and certainly like the closing stretch and i remember after watching this match thinking like oh yeah like this Brody lee luke harper he's actually good like he finally got some like cuffs off of him here got to work a, a longer extended match and everything it's like this was a big breakout match for him and i remember thinking like all right, cool. Do something with this guy. He's proven that he's good. He's been a very, very important piece of this storyline. Cause I, I'm a big fan of this storyline. I mean, how it ended and everything, but like the, the, the overall narrative of the storyline and how they, they kind of piece it together was, was very well done. Uh, you know, it sucked that it ended with cockroaches on the on the mat on a projector screen. But uh, yeah, I remember I thought Brody was like, all right, this is a big breakout match for him. And now we're going to see some more from him. And what happened, happened with him. And it's very unfortunate because you would think after watching this match, like, all right, this is a guy we can utilize in a bigger role. I mean, people, I see people in the chat saying like, it should have been a triple threat. Um, and, and Carlito says maybe even a four way with AJ, but like, yeah, I think a lot of people were pushing for a triple threat on this mm-hmm. and it wasn't just based off of this match. Cause I think the storyline could have like even called for the triple threat, but this match certainly helped, uh, Brody's case. I thought, and of course we know what kind of happened. Yeah, it is a shame. And it's, it's one of those ones that, you know, I think we all would like to enjoy it, <clears throat> just as we is, right? It's a match between, the whatever you think, one of the great kind of most revered, I should say, I won't say great, I'll say one of the most revered performers of his generation. It's a match with him for a guy who, as we just know, it didn't get many of those opportunities on the major, um, you know, scale as a singles guy. But it is hard to enjoy completely in that setting because we are, I think, all still left saying what could have been. Yeah. You know, and... I think it would be an easier pill to swallow, well, for a couple of reasons, but just talking purely within this year of wrestling, he didn't even get anything out of it. This isn't a case of, oh, he didn't main event WrestleMania, but he did. What he actually did was he feuded with Rowan for a month after Mania and then was just sort of taken off. It's it's a bizarre one. We, we, you know, we'll, never know, we'll never know what the real kind of reasoning was that made any sense to anyone. It seems to me like it was a lot of silliness, but that's not what we're reviewing, so, you yeah. know. Just, you can't get that back, right? It's sad, very sad. But it's a cool match. I do want to say, I want to shout out um, at Joseph Weirdness on Twitter, who has a much cooler last name than, than mine, and I would not want to butcher it. He, he does wonderful stuff on YouTube and inexplicably has less views than our shitty podcast. But he did a five-match primer on Randy Orton uh, because he wanted to respond to the kind of outrage at Jim Ross saying he was the best wrestler in the world. Not because he thinks he is the best wrestler, but what, he, what Joseph was trying to get across was, hey, Randy can be really good. I really recommend you guys watch that because it's brilliant. But not just that. I do think it's interesting, as this match was suggested by Tim, I, I like the suggestion, I like the match. But it was interesting to me, Jeremy, that I immediately knew the finish of the match. And I'm not saying that that's the be on end all. But if a guy like Randy Orton says to you, I'm not someone that wants my matches to end with a oh, it's finally over, but instead a, the most memorable moment of the match is the finish, you pop on the finish. That's what Randy's ideology is. We all know that hasn't always worked, right? We all know that. 
I think it speaks to how much Randy has got that finish over, though, and how he executes it, that we all immediately remember the finish of this match. Because there are so many matches that are critically acclaimed, and rightly so, that none of us will remember the finish of, really. And I think that's interesting. If nothing else, Orton is great at that, right? He knows that. Put that RKO somewhere, you'll remember it forever. So that is um, that is pretty neat, if you ask me. Now, I did see a cool comment, which I'll now get to, because it looked funny. Cleo for Press says, what's up, brothers? I just binged the last two BPW episodes, and I love how the best two storylines right now are the tribute to Larry Steve, uh, who is inexplicably still alive in this universe, and Jeremy not knowing the difference between Blake and Murphy. This is very fair. Yes. Did you listen to the latest Talking Shop? I did, yeah. They didn't know it either. I was very happy. I, <laughs> I was going to take you about that. Machine Gun Carl Anderson you know, right? was like, Blake Murphy? Blake, what, one of them got released. <laughs> That's really wild, because they're like... Based on how they talked about him, they're friendly with him. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know the brother's name, man. I was going to text you as well. I was like, I'll talk yeah. to him later today and I'll bring it up. <laughs> yeah, I saw the headline you got from that shit. Oh, my God. That, I don't think that went well, did it, on Twitter? I mean, it went well in the sense they got traction, but I saw some people were mad. Jeremy got very, very mad at Machine Gun Carl Anderson. I mean, that's why you got to read the full quote. Like, you know, if yeah. you read the full quote and get the context, it's not as bad as the headline makes it out to be, but... That's what he said, so the easy yeah. headline. I also think people that know, like, people that know that podcast know the tone he delivered in. Yeah. It was more just like, come on, this fuck. You know, it wasn't like, listen here. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, it was more related to that, but, but sure. nonetheless. I mean, I'm shocked he hasn't, Machine Gun Carl Anderson hasn't DM'd you and be like, hey, what's up with your fucking guy over here with these headlines? He would have. <laughs> he would have. Too big of a fan. Um, okay, folks, it's time for the dreaded Bob spot. As we review Bob O'Neill's first match on my match. Like the first match he ever watched? Yeah, no, no, not quite. (laughs) I I would like it to be that, but he's not. He's his first suggested match. He's actually suggested a couple. But this is the one we'll be doing today. It is is the Sid, the Psycho Sid Man versus the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. Survivor Series 1996. One that Bob talks about pretty often, I think. He likes it very much. Does he? I think so. Oh, Uh, okay. (laughs) Anra said, I, I say this now as Anra because I want to say the whole thing and nearly lied an aneurysm. He said, says, this is this was hell. Tremendous. <laughs> um, okay, look, folks. This is not one for the finer details of the art form, the in-ring art form. This is a moment in time. Because here, we transport ourselves to November 1996 at Madison Square Garden as a smart crowd decides we want Sid to Fuck murder Shawn Michaels, Michaels is yes. what this crowd says. Yes. <laughs> it is an insane moment in time that has been completely erased from history because Sid is like... like People talk about Sid now as though he was never a top guy. And it's like, he was such a top guy that the Mecca, he was cheered over WWF's <laughs> centerpiece. A guy they've been pushing for a year. It is extraordinary, okay? I do want to give Bob some stick here because NXT, when they do a big match... They do that thing, don't they, Jerry? That dun 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 dun. Yeah, you know that thing yeah, they do. Yeah. Dun dun. Yeah. And Bob always tweets, "It's not a cage match. Why are they doing the dun dun dun?" <laughs> they do it here, Bob, in the match you picked. One of your favorites. They do they it do for. The dun, dun, dun. They do it before Montreal, too. Yeah, it's, it's a thing. Like it is genuinely a thing. They just yeah, they used matches. to do it all the time for these big matches. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Filth. I just want to call Bob. I out. mean, if O'Neill actually, you know, watched wrestling back then, he'd he'd know these things yeah. and went back and watched this stuff, but. You know, he started watching in, what, like 2015 or something? So he doesn't... 2000, know. Yeah, 2019, he started watching. Okay. When gotcha. the Wild Club came. Okay. Yeah. Um, new cheer. Jay Ben. Oh, my goodness. 1,000. That's a lot. Thanks, Jay Ben. Oh, Appreciate it, buddy. I'm an expert on that's a lot. Um, my note literally says, NXT's dun-dun-dun things here, <laughs> proving Bob is wrong about it being a cage match only deal. Then it just says, Bob is always wrong. And then I go back to him at the match. Factual. Now, someone mentioned here, I am correct, it said, Sid looks like a million bucks to his entrance. Dude, Sid, <laughs> Sid comes out, and he's like, turning around, fist bump, and he's doing it with such intensity, yeah. he's almost scary. And there is a level of electricity, and like this energy and intensity, and this is what I'm talking about, bro. When I say stuff like, cross is a shit, Sid, I'm not saying get out there, match ratings, grass. So what I'm saying is, watch this entrance, and you will realise what I mean, because Sid appears to be insane. Like, he looks like an absolute killer. It's a physical charisma that genuinely there are very few guys in the whole industry have now. Like, maybe definitely not then, but even now, 
when people talk about how much great there is a lot of great talent but if Sid came out he would still go over because it's physical charisma it's an intensity it's a presence thing it's what we talk about with Goldberg a lot now he's worth credit in the WWF who his whole presentation at this point fucking rules he has the thing the Sid thing that comes up behind him and JR goes SID suddenly I'm dominant it's like <laughs> um, yeah, Jim has a really rough this is when Jim is like kind of like a dickhead with Vince on commentary it's a really weird time for Jim Ross he's just trying to get his job back I want to say it's weird it's a different time, different time. I didn't know Sid was an acronym that's what Jim was saying I don't know <laughs> suddenly I'm dominant rules so much <laughs> it does, it does. Um, okay so <laughs> Sid is standing there with his own name behind him and he's all fired up like, you know and he's just fist bumped everyone and and then the, the big screen flashes Sean walking out of his locker room and the crowd immediately boos this man. Like, it is not like a case of, oh, he loses them along the way. They boo him on sight. Yeah. Like, it's over for sure. And he knows he's very bad. Bless his heart. Um, he's, you know, he's, there's some girls screaming, which is neat. Bless him. But it is a, a very, very visceral, aggressive boo. So, out they come. They're staring each other down. And Sid immediately goes to work. And by work, I mean, he throws those shitty, like, clubbing strikes he throws. He never could figure out how to throw anything that looked good. He just, yeah, he does that stuff. And the people cheer. Sean rallies. It all looks good. And I can confirm, no one cares. It gets like, it actually is very John Cena, to be honest. It's very, like, there's a light scream and cheer, but it's mostly just aggressive booze. It's very, and at this point, I think Sean realizes it's going to be a tough night at the office. Sean then grabs a hold in seemingly an, an attempt to like settle things down. And he lands some slaps. And then Sid does the exact same spot. He also gets a headlock and slaps Sean in the face, which is in fact a baby face spot, which it means at this point, Sean, if he wasn't fucked before, he is now doomed. Because even the kids are pretty sick. They're like, man, Sid just called it. And that was awesome. It's just very scary stuff, Drew. Very scary. Now, Sid gets Sean to trade strikes with him, and Jim Ross and Vince McMahon talk about Sid like he's Mike Tyson. Like, don't do it. Just don't throw punches with him. It's like, he's punches like shit. Throw punches with him. He'll be fine. But he, you he know, has a like, weird wind up. He's like, yes, it's, it's <laughs> real bad, man. Like, it's, like, it's such a shame because it feels like if a guy just, if he wanted to, he could have been like serviceable that he could have made even more money. Because he makes enough money just off his look and presence. Yeah. It's crazy. But anyway. I do want to stress that Bobby's not wrong about this being one of Sid's best matches. Like, it is, which is peak Sid. But anyway. Um, Sean, he then nearly gets a powerbomb and Sean bows to ringside, which is like more of Sean kind of working as the heel, which, not ideal, but I guess you got to go with it when people are booing you. People. <laughs> this is tremendous. He takes a powder and the people are just suddenly just like going, Sid! 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 <laughs> Sean is like a lamb to slaughter. It's, it's brutal. Um... Sean then runs from Sid. Again, not ideal as the babyface champ, but what are you going to do? And then he cuts him off with a chop block. Okay. At this point, he goes for a figure four, and the people are very angry. And he just stands there and soaks in the booze and does appear like he could cry. It is very, very sad stuff. They, they hate the figure four. I mean, hate it. And now we're left with Sid sort of playing as underdog babyface. It's all, it's all a thing. It's, just, it's an event. You need to see it, folks. It's a weird match. It is a good match, I think, on an objective scale, but it is very weird, and it will always be more known as the spectacle of it. Eventually, Sid pushes Sean into the post and, and uh, like, you know, rallies in sort of very Sid fashion. There's no real energy to it. He sort of walks around a little bit and punches him a couple of times. Um, there is a neat spot where Sid backs into the cameraman. And I I may be giving them too much credit, but 90s WF was pretty attention to detail. I think this is to set up him later snatching the camera. Mm. I really do, because he backs into the cameraman and, like, pie faces him. And WF don't do shit like that wrong, right? They never have to kill the cameras, like, you know, because that was very WCW. I think that was done on purpose. If so, someone was putting far too much thought into this match. But God bless them. Now, where are we at here? Um... Yes, Sean goes back to the leg, and the audience, I can confirm, has not they've not changed their mind or warmed up any to, to poor Sean, who is, like, he's really working hard. He's taking these great buckle bumps. He's, you know, he's trying his best. He's had a great in-ring year in 1996. They don't care. <laughs> it's insane this was a smart crowd, right? Like, smart. the definition of smart fan really switched big time over the next decade because this is, you know, it's a work rate guy getting booed mercilessly. But anyway, um, there is... It is worth noting that while we watch this down, after seeing John Cena deal with, deal with a decade, you could easily look at Sean looking like he's going to cry and clown him. But, like, 
it is worth 1996, man. This is pretty brutal to get booed like this as a baby face. You know, this is pretty. I get why Sean was rattled by it. This is wild. This, this was not a common thing, especially when he's so naturally the underdog with a match his story. But anyway, um, there is a cool spot where Sean does the old, like, it's just skins the cat deal, the rumble spot. And immediately turns around to a clothesline. And they do it later where he kips up and Sid just clotheslines it immediately. No, no time for Sean's bullshit. Um, yes, Sean is bumping. He's, you know, every combat attempt is cut off and faulted. It's, it's, it's good stuff. They turn the story of a champ that won't give up and is too tough for his own good and getting his ass kicked. It's, it's very simple stuff, but it works. No, no problem with it. Um... <laughs> The Sid, of course, is not, like, good, is he? So, with the crowd on his side, Sid then goes for, like, a million-dollar dream deal and just sort of sits around in his hold for a bit. He starts screaming spots in Sean's ear very, very loudly. I do not know why Sid was calling anything with Sean Michaels, but apparently he was. It's very loud. And then Sean pokes it in the eye because he is, in fact, an asshole. He, he, but he can't, still can't come back. There's a choke slam. People are going crazy for Sid's every single success. They've decided they want a title change. And as we know, they're going to get one, right? It's <laughs> The problem is, in, considering everything we know about this, like Sid should have just won, and then you have Sean beat him two months later. And it's, this finish is diabolical. I don't know if you remember this, I Jeremy. Do. I do. Yeah, so he snatches the camera, yeah. waits for like four years, and hits poor Jose Lafario. <laughs> With the, Who takes a, a bump? Yeah, something like trick. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sean hits a super kick, and MSG is like, he's going to beat him. Like, this is bullshit, yeah. and immediately starts booing. <laughs> but then they do this thing where it's like, oh, he's so worried about Jose, he's going to go and check on him rather than get the pin, mm. which is just like goofy shit they do now, and it's just like just like pin him and then check on Jose. Fuck it. Right. Especially that feels dated here, doesn't it? Yeah. You could see it in, in 1990 with Gorilla on commentary and hanging and all that. You could see it getting over, but this is not the time, clearly, with this crowd anyway. And then, like, Jose, he's, he's clutching his chest, and Jim Ross is, like, convinced he's had a heart attack. Yeah. <laughs> Just completely, like, immediately as soon as he's had a heart attack. It's like, no, he got hit in the chest. Like, it's, yeah, whatever. But but anyway, and there's a lot of interest in the comments, which I'll work for you guys. I'm not ignoring you. I'll get there. But. Sean is checking on Lafara, and Sid just starts like, I just starts like walking around, like he's standing behind Sean. Like, what am I supposed to do now? What do I? See, he's all, and then he brings Sean in, and there's a ref bump, and then Sid then hits Sean with a camera, which I think is what he was thinking about doing earlier, but forgot that to do another spot first. Then Jr. still thinks he's having a heart attack. Uh, Jose, that is, and, and then um, he hears the power bomb just pins him it's a horrid finish but the people are so happy that there's a title change they do not care it's not even flat people are like yeah it's still got him there is a girl in the front row folks if you ever rewatch this or you want to just pull up the finish there is a girl in the front row this is like this is the end of wrestling for like she can't fathom that the heartbreak kid has been felled by the sid man she like everyone else around her is like one two and she's sitting there like kick kick come on kick it's great oh, i love stuff i want to see this yeah, but you'll you enjoy it. Because you know MSG shoots the ramp? That's the hard cam back in the day. Yeah. It's like the front row on the on the left of the screen. Right. Um, look, man, it's a fun match. It's a cool match. Like, kind of a neat time capsule. It's obviously not a classic, but I completely agree with Bob that it's one of Sid's best matches. I also love one of Bob's... Um, not Bob. Bob didn't wrestle Goldberg. <laughs> Sid did. One of Sid's matches with Goldberg is also very, very fun. I'm going to go to the chat here. What season um, was this? <laughs> I don't know, dude, whatever 1996 was. Yes, yeah, so I do want to like Whiskey Dick's Creek. Sid and, you know, Vlad the super fan, like he hugs him. Fucking rules. Um, okay, let me, what we got here in the chat? My God. My God, there's a lot here. Okay. Sid needs to turn in suddenly I'm dominant before BP Dub blows up. <laughs> Handsome Pat. Oh, he redeemed his message. He says, my phone keeps dying because I'm checking on Cam all day. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what Cam did, but he spilled my timeline today. Is he okay? Is Cam okay, Jeremy? Do we know fine. Cam's okay? He's fine. Good. He had a rough morning. Okay. Yeah. I will not ask on air, but I logged on and legitimately saw that he filled my whole timeline. Like, <laughs> seems, seems bad. Um, okay. What have we got here? According to Cage Match, his last match was 2017 against Paul Rosenberg for GN Dub. Tremendous. Um, a year earlier, the same people were begging Sean to be the guy. Bro, it's literally like... There's so many comparisons you can make with mid '90s WWF and the stuff we see like in the last decade. Yeah. Where it's like when they push a guy, they do it in a certain way that the crowd doesn't like. Because Diesel's the same thing. 
Diesel was a full-on Roman Reigns case. I mean, I think Roman's way more talented, but like, it's that thing where they they do it, and I think one of Sean's biggest issues was the way Vince would talk about him on Con. Yeah, Vince was absurd with the shit on Con. Like, he was so desperate trying to get him over his top baby. It's just, it's a weird time. Um, Raw one thousand, he worked Heath Slater. I've never seen that, but I've like seen the fun now on YouTube a hundred times. Um, Ray says his third to last match was twenty eleven. He beat Eddie Kingston in five seconds. Someone ask Eddie about this match. This sounds tremendous. This sounds great. All right, um, here we go. I'm watching. I'm watching the finish now. I okay. can't get a screenshot on Peacock, but I'm gonna try to. All right, now sit as the camera. He's hit Sean with the camera. Yep. So it's after the finish. It's on the pin. It's on the pin. It's the. It's the. Um... On the left, the first fan you'll see, like the absolute corner of the stand. Okay. You know? There's a young lady there. Okay. She's got a dude with her who's like not helping because he's been a real dick about it too. You should see her on the pin. Oh, I see her. Yeah. The oh, strong, no. right? Oh, she's screaming! Oh man. She wanted him to kick. Yeah, right she screamed Sean at the three. She's like Shaw. Yeah. This like almost falls the end over the guardrail as he doesn't kick out. Oh, this poor lady. You're right. Wrestling just ended for her. Is that her dad with her, or like, what do you think? I can't remember if he looked older. No, nah, he doesn't look like super old. Whoever he is, he was a real dick in that time, right? He's like, yeah, yeah. come on. <laughs> she has a camera though, like a like just a ginormous camera. I didn't think you could get yeah. those things into the arena. Yeah. Um. 50 bits Tremendous. from Antoine, it looks like. I imagine that. Tremendous. This is very good. Um, if so, thank you, Antoine. However many bits it is, thank you. It's very, very nice. I appreciate it. Uh, the Kingston match is on YouTube, apparently. I've legit never seen this match. Not even doing a bit. I'll watch it. It's five Another seconds. Uh, I was gonna this say... is a good point. Oh, hold on. Oh, wow. EW What's viewership, that? not good. A-dub? Yeah. What is it? How long are we talking? Uh, four. Off a rampage. Four sixty-two. My God. Yeah, Didn't dude. someone have a higher number earlier? Dave said that it was higher. Torch said it's four sixty-two. This is a really slippery slope. The fact that everyone's getting different reports on this stuff, right? Yeah. It's not ideal. No, it's not. Yeah, I think Dave said it was like up uh, from the week prior. From what I remember, Dave has so many like tweets that I'm gonna try to go through his timeline and see if I can see it. Oh, I forgot he. Right, hold on. I mean, the episode. Yeah, like, I agree. The episode wasn't very good. No, it was. It was. It wasn't great. It wasn't a great episode at all. I do feel like it's one of those things where it, like, there was a lot of things that show that could have been done better, but it really does seem as though the audience, like, the people that I follow anyway, are all just like, uh, I don't really care until they get back in front of fans. Like, having doubled enough and then going to that really... How many people did they have on Friday, Jeremy? That crowd was really flat. It, it, it was live really at 10. Like, I don't know if yeah. that's the best idea to try to do a live show at 10 o'clock either. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think you're probably right. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's just going to be a pain in the ass if everyone disagree on what the actual number is. Yeah, so. it's... It sucks without show buzz. Like, I know there's other websites that are reported. Um, but yeah, without show buzz, man. Like, because you could, like, at least set your clock to that. You know what I mean? Like, 4 mm-hmm. o'clock is when it's going to come out. It's good. Like, the other websites like Spoiler TV, I think I feel like that's the best one that kind of does demographic rating and stuff. I don't know when that those not like they're they're like two weeks behind on stuff. And then Torch is getting different numbers, Dave's getting different numbers. Like, there's no way Dave concedes defeat on this number, right? Oh fuck no, fuck <laughs> yeah. no. He will no. He will argue it to death that that you know like. By the way, do you remember last week on BP Dub? I was like, "Saint Big's happening tonight." Remember that? 
Yeah, didn't I was thinking about that when Andrade showed up. I thought we were, I didn't know what show we did because we do so many shows. Mm-hmm. When you're like something's big at tonight, and I was like, oh yeah, I heard Andrade showing up tonight, and you're like, yeah, I heard that too. And then I think we we killed it by saying no, but yeah. I I did not hear that, but yeah, I was very confident saying it would happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. not Daniel Bryan or actually even Andrade, but I just you know. There you go, folks. We need to talk about it at some point because we all like really going our own way with that shit, and we should be embarrassed. All of us should be embarrassed. What Andrade? But we, when he got free, every person in the world was like, "Oh, AEW," and then we all started like, "Well, Ring of Honor." He has some Facebook friends. Yeah. It's like we're idiots, dude. Like Tony Khan's got the deepest pockets. <laughs> if he can make it happen, if he wants to make it happen, he'll make it happen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, mean, I saw I, someone. Um, go ahead. Who's gonna? I was gonna say I thought I thought Ring of Honor, and I thought that mm-hmm. I thought he's gonna end up back in WWE because of. This is what right. it seemed like. No, I'm not clowning you because I did the same shit. But what I'm saying is, like, we really talked ourselves in circles with this Andrade thing. Yeah. And and it was dumb in hindsight because the reality was the the end result was exactly what everyone just initially expected it to be. Yeah. He went to AEW. Um, so there you go. Up next, we have a unique choice. Here's my friend, good brother Ray Callahan, great supporter of the show, a pal. As he picks the invisible man... <laughs> versus the invisible stand <laughs> folks this is going to be a journey here we go this is at Joey Jindler's Spring Break 3 for yeah. those of you wondering it's on YouTube it's got a pretty good view count it is worth a watch if you sound like if, when you listen to this you, and you haven't seen it you may think that I'm going so out of real quickly sorry okay. Joseph so Dave oh. said on June 5th which would have been the day after uh, mm-hmm. Dynamite he said early numbers not Nielsen have AEW up significantly from last week. Feels like something that they've given him. And now, according to the torch, they are down uh, about a hundred thousand. Would you agree that I know, I'm not even trying to like be a dick? I have no issue with Dave, but it feels like a saying that was given to him pretty directly, right? Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. I'm gonna be honest, dude. Like, I do think he's interested in track ratings, but. The fact that the main site has died really feels like a signal of sorts to us, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's fine. It will be fine, guys. I, I don't know. I, I, I've never been the guy. I don't agree with the Saturn take of, like, LOL ratings. Like, people talk about, you know, box office and film. They talk about album sales and music. They do all this stuff. But I do think there's an issue with doing the whole thing. Of like, good equals many, many viewers. Bad equals few. We should probably stop doing that. That's all I would say. Yeah. Now, folks... I did know what it was. I've seen it before. Very different time in my life where I probably thought it was dog shit. This is this is a different time for me. I am more open-minded, and I was looking forward to it because I'm a big fan of Bryce. Who I know this is something he's very proud of. Clearly, this is something very, very different. I think everyone would agree that has seen it. Uh, to be clear, so we're all working with an equal play, play set here, you know, set of rules. This is, in fact, a match between two invisible men. Um, yeah. So... It is, on the surface, exactly that dumb. However, there are some interesting ideas. I'm not doing a bit. Because this is kind of a, like, fun exploration into what the fuck wrestling actually is. In the sense that it explores what is possible when armed with a crowd that is willing to be as energetic as this and buy in on an idea. As well as this kind of... It kind of... Pokes fun, it kind of pays homage to every wrestling spot that if you've watched 10 matches you've seen 50 times <laughs> and it uses that to create an, an audience reaction to something that isn't actually happening this is not me doing a bit here or being generous to Ray I think Ray is someone I speak with enough that he knows I would just say this was shit if I thought it was this is actually an interesting match for what we're doing which is reviewing wrestling you know, everyone knows I'm a big fan of the idea that wrestling is genres right this is really interesting because it like, pulls apart what wrestling even is in, in a weird way. So, basically, for those unaware, Stan is a heel <laughs> <laughs> and the Invisible Man is the baby face. The audience is all in on this point. They are like, and they shoot it a certain way. You need to see it to understand it, but like, the crowd is fully aware that Stan is the heel and the Invisible Man is the baby face. We all love the Bryce Rams, though, because he's just one of the great men in the industry, tremendous personality. But this very much is his peak. This is his crown jewel. This is the one he'll probably remember for forever. He requires, he needs the bad boy vision to know what's going on here so he can officiate things professionally. 
And away we go, the bell rings, and it is basically, as I said, utilising all of the most familiar wrestling tropes in a fashion that the audience always knows what's going on without anything actually going on. So, for example, you know, Bryce will just step to the corner, and it's like everyone knows, because you've watched wrestling, oh, they're starting a lock-up, and the guy's back to the corner, you know, and he's got to try and separate. And it is, that is as silly as it is. Then they do this, this is probably my favourite part of the match. They do the uh, like Jerry Lynn, Rob Van Dam spot where they exchange pin attempts and then square off. Yeah. And Bryce obviously does that part. But even before he does that, you know full yeah, well what they're doing because Bryce is one, yeah. two. You know? <laughs> and he's like, again, I have to stress, this is not something you would sit down so, at someone that doesn't watch wrestling and go, look, get it. They wouldn't find it funny. But this isn't who they're trying to... This is for people that know exactly what that was a reference to. And they spotted it as soon as, it, as they started doing it, what it was. Um... They then trade strikes and Bryce is, you know, like selling on each punch. It's, it's true. Now, this is interesting, actually. There you go. Antoine says, this is one of my dad's favourite matches. He doesn't watch wrestling. Like I do, but he likes trading. Oh, okay, that's different. I would love to know. To me, this is something that requires, like, an, a certain understanding of wink-wink level. But I could be wrong about that. Because Bryce is so damn funny in this thing that it may be just funny. I don't know. Like, it is. It's wacky enough that it could be. Um... Stan being the heel gouges the eyes seemingly and which gets big heat Bryce is very upset of this and then both men seemingly request and are given a chair by Bryce to sort of sit in front of each other in sort of Katsuri Shibata style and trade strikes um, this is very violent stuff Bryce is selling with every blow uh, and there is blood Jeremy one of these men is bleeding Bryce has the gloves out they brawl to the floor and <laughs> Bryce begins to charge through the crowd so he can keep track of where these guys are going as they fight up through the audience and he watches on as horror as, a, as an apparent balcony spot takes place <laughs> and all of the you know like security guys and referee guys take a bump on the floor as though they've just been landed on by a balcony spot all this stuff really I, I have to stress this to you folks you have not seen this match this stuff is more over with the audience than like premier wrestling matches go over it's a it's a really interesting case study um so yeah the refs are on the floor we fight back to the ring and there is a 2.9 count the people bite on the false finish jeremy they fight big time stan is enraged by this apparently and he targets poor bryce uh, who and takes him out ref bump here in the invisible man fight um Kikataru then arrives and he takes the glasses and hits a ddt on stan at this point, Bryce comes over to do a 2.9 count. It shades of like Hebner in the Attitude Era, where he's like, one, grabs his arm a little bit, like that whole deal. It's, you know, it's all just, it's all pretty charming if, you, if, you, if you're familiar, which you know, everyone in this audience obviously is. Um, then Kikitaro takes a bump. He's dropped by one of them. The, audience, the commentators finally seem somewhat confused as to which invisible person this is, which is a, a first, because the rest of the time the, the commentary was just as in tune with everything else. It was perfect. Um, and then they do a table bump a table bump for the finish place pops the invisible man is the victor of course all silliness aside and that seems like ridiculous thing to say because it is pure silliness it is a fun like experiment yeah. it's a credit to Bryce who is brilliant here clearly but it's also kind of like an acknowledgement of how familiar wrestling is right like the idea that wrestling is always just one group of ideas placed in different orders because the audience at every point knows what they're referencing and what they're doing like at every single point they know what's going on here it's the idea that like that the audience is so in on the bit and so familiar with pro wrestling they don't even need the wrestlers to be doing the pro wrestling they just need the idea and they've got it it's outrageous, it's absurd, it's one that someone out there probably lost their shit over until it's very embarrassed business. But in reality, it's actually a really neat little kind of piece of the wrestling puzzle in the sense that it's just a fun idea executed in front of a, a rowdy crowd that has fun with it. And that's that's about it. I actually enjoyed doing it. It was... Because, you know, we look for variety. I mean, Jesus, you know, we get more <laughs> more varied effort than the Invisible Man versus the Invisible Stan. It's fun, man. It's... it's, it's it's a really cool kind of little little venture, little concept, maybe now you'd describe it, but it's I don't know, I, tr I try my best to explain it to you folks, I'd recommend you watch it because clearly it's out there um, before I get to some of these comments, Jeremy, do you have any memories of this one? Because I was saying you'd pop for I remember watching it live because um, I love the oh. spring break shows those are usually a staple of my Wrestlemania mm -hmm. week watching and I didn't know 
what the fuck to expect from it when they announced it and everything. But Rimsburg is like a force in this match because yeah. like, if you get somebody else, like he, he has to carry things, right? Because the mm-hmm. audience knows what's happening in the match based on what he's doing. So like he carries this whole thing with, just with his actions and his mannerisms. And it's just a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, performance by him. Uh, yeah, Northwood says didn't mention the the brother versus brother aspect. There's like a whole backstory to this, right? That's awesome, <laughs> everything. Right? I, yeah. I know that's the the okay, the comments that mentioned that, but like I I'm lo- I'm just watching it in a vacuum. Yeah, uh, but yeah, he tried to like kill him and everything. I remember writing articles on it, and Jimmy got mad at, at some of the articles. He's like, I don't get it. Like, why are we doing articles on this? It, it's not wrestling. Jimmy's not a fan of this, Joseph. I don't know if that shocks you or not. <laughs> no, not particularly. Um, you know what is interesting about this match, Jeremy? It's a really interesting watch after we spent a year watching Empty Arena Wrestling, isn't it? Yeah. In the sense that the audience is so powerful that it's like, it's actively exciting watching guys not exist, <laughs> which is really bizarre stuff. But you're, I, I, I know you well enough to know like, this would you would pop at this and not go, oh my god, let me put some Crockett tapes on. The business is dead, right? It's fun. Yeah, it, it's it's a very fun match. Um, yeah, I know it's free on YouTube. How many views does this thing have? I feel like it's like, got uh, nearly seven hundred thousand. It's, really? it's around there. I kind of thought it had mm-hmm. more than that. I mean, for what it is, that's I mean, look, it's more than they had on TV this week over at Dynamo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know the one of the most famous matches I saw the comment about some of Bryce's great indie like the referee the matches he's refereed on the indie level he did the famous Necro Samoa Joe match and he gets like bumped in that within a minute that match is that's maybe one we should discuss at some juncture um, okay what else we got here uh, Ray was popping as I went through I'm glad to hear that Ray um Antoine said, in an entertainment aspect, aspect, it's great. My dad's view was if this guy can essentially have a match by himself and keep the audience engaged as far as they were, yeah, that's it. That's good stuff. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the review, Ray. I tried my best. I, I, when you suggested it to me, I know you was like messing, and I was like, I'll do it. Because I remember people that I respect saying about it, it's an interesting thing, so I, would, I was happy to revisit it. Um, big fight feel for a fake fight for a fake sport, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. No, it's, it's if as silly as this sounds. If there's a match, if you haven't watched any of these matches, I would recommend you watch that one because it's the one that will be most make you ponder what we even watch every week. It's that kind of deal. Good choice, Ray. I believe Ray may give me a couple of those. But when, by the way, guys, when you give me like two or three suggestions, they are all noted. Like I've got them scheduled in. It's just a matter of spreading things out. Um, Video comes out in the search for a shoot interview of the Invisible Man on Fightful YouTube. Is that a thing Sean did? <laughs> I don't know, but that sounds tremendous. That's uh, oh, that might have been. Hold on, let me look. I think. I mean, he must have done it, right? Because it's... apparently so. Okay, I'm just gonna Google Invisible Man Fightful. I don't see it. Where are you? Where are you finding this? Uh, JJ. JJ said. Maybe like a suggested search. I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, um, okay. I'll let that settle because I just review a match between two invisible people. <laughs> um, there you go, JJ. Okay. It's in the it's in the gimmick. Okay, oh, cool. Wow. So up next is my match, which I know is when everyone turns off because it's me being a, a dickhead. Now, I am using this, folks, for some self promotion here. Because uh, I am in the same Fightful magazine as the Matt Cardona man, Jeremy. I don't know if you saw this. He did not talk about Michael, but he mentioned he was in the magazine. Shot a hell of an angle this weekend. Yeah, so it was good, really good. good. Job. Yeah, it was really good stuff. Um, famously, and by famously I mean I mentioned it a couple of times, I have an article in that magazine in which I cover the iconic Ric Flair Terry Funk feud from 1989. I would make sense now that that magazine's actually being shipped out and you guys can purchase it on the Fightful Shop gimmick. It would make sense that I do one of the famed Flair Funk matches from 89. So, this is the less famous match, right? The, you know, the, the iconic match is the I Quit match from Clash of Champions that everyone remembers and lives... I've seen really kind of um, expert voices say it was, the, it was at the time it was the greatest match of all matches. And I, and I think that's an interesting kind of just, wow, what a statement. But here is the, the prequel to that sequel. We are two months removed 
from um, Terry Funk shooting that magic angle where he enters as an in-ring judge. He kind of hangs around a little bit. He's talking, you know, he's he's asking for a title shot. Rick doesn't want to, you know, he's saying you're not in the top ten. You've been out there with Sylvester Stallone. Terry suddenly goes from being jovial old man to insane person. It's an incredible angle. If you watch only one thing I compliment, please make it that. WrestleWar 89, it's fabulous. In the two months since, Ric Flair has been out with a neck injury because he's pole driving onto the table. Remember the pole driver? They use it a lot in this thing. And he's back now with Avenged as the babyface. Ric Flair is not a comfortable babyface, but in this particular feud, he's just remarkable in the role because it works. The story works, and, and it, you know the people are into Rick enough. Terry is six years removed from his first retirement. He's a couple of years removed from what you call full-time competition, but he's desperate to kind of reassert himself in that in that tier, in that conversation as one of the, as one of the greats today, not yesterday, today. His entrance is iconic. You know the the man with the harmonica deal playing. Gary Hart's there. He's unhinged. He's sort of lost in just the lunacy he's got himself into. How has he managed to get himself in his position? He doesn't really know. But here he is. You know he's he's in here now. He's got to fight Ric Flair, right? <laughs> he was a judge two months ago. Rick enters with his lady friends, and he's like, he's grinning like Bob O'Neill doing Bronson Reed. You know, like his fists are clenched. Locked arms with these women. He's physic. He's so excited about the fact he can now beat up Terry Funk. He's great because opposite him, of course, is a man that doesn't even appear to know quite what's going on in Terry Funk. He's like walking around aimlessly. He's out of his mind. Okay, he's middle aged and crazy, as they used to say. So, <laughs> so Flair's fight up for revenge, and Terry is like walking around. He's all over the place. He's stomping. He's stomping around, and and Flair just jumps him, and the chops immediately emerge. And this just becomes a theme throughout the rivalry, folks of Rick just absolutely blistering Terry with chops. And some guys take chops, chops like cowards. Other guys do what Terry Funk does and just let him get absolutely killed by him. His chest is getting blistered from every angle. It's it's genuinely almost brutal. It's just chops and punches. It's, it's, it's remarkable stuff. Um, Funk, in response to this, jumps around and, and like tries to get some weaponry. He's threatening to fight fans. He's forcing Rick to go out and grab him and chase him around. Um, and Rick is just at every chance kicking the shit out of him. He's the babyface here, right? And Rick is not a guy armed with great offense, which is why his babyface stuff is often pretty flat. Against Terry Funk, that's no real issue, because every punch matters, every chop matters, every kick matters. It's a fight, and it, frankly, Flair is, you know, the the dom he's in control of that thing. So, every time, by the way, that Flair hits him with those chops, with those punches, Funk does this cell that's like... It's such a, a kind of resentful bit of like, I can't believe you actually just did that shit, you know? Like, he, can't, he just can't believe. Like, there's one shot where he literally drew his stapler. I to say, come on, dude, really? You're still going to be hitting with him with him chops? It's amazing stuff. So, um, Funk is, he's, you know, he's whacked to the floor, and then he gains control because he sends Flair head first into the post. Now that he's finally got a grip on things, he starts dishing out some of the disrespect that he felt at WrestleWar. You know, he's slapping him, and, he, and then he starts targeting the champ's neck, which obviously, as I just said, was an injury angle with a pole driver. Uh, in response, uh, Flair attempts to suplex the floor, and they both just fall down. With Terry Funk, I've never have any idea what he's intended to do, whether that's what he's supposed to like or not. He just falls down a lot, folks. If you haven't watched a lot of Terry Funk, it may be alarming to you, but he does. He just falls off things a lot. Um... Now they're about to square one on the floor. They're trading chops and punches. And every time they do that, there's a really cool little bit here. Every time they trade chops and punches, Rick kicks his ass. But Rick then goes with an eye poke, which is very familiar, right, Jeremy? Rick Flair always did eye pokes. No, nothing new with that. This is one game he cannot win against Terry Funk, who takes both of his thumbs and gouges both of Rick's eyes at once. <laughs> it's tremendous. The idea that he may be the dirtiest player in the game, but he's not going to out eye poke Terry Funk pops me very much. Um... Funk's now thinking pole drive, but Flair backdrops himself free. Um, and then we go back to that theme of revenge, man. And Flair now is going after Funk's neck, and he starts doing the, the fiend Bray Wyatt shit. You know, where you do, you twist the neck. Remember that spot Bray does, Jeremy, when he used to wrestle? Uh, he killed Finn Balor with that, sent him to yeah, NXT. He, right, he pays homage with that. Um, he loves Bray Wyatt, does Ric Flair. He starts doing that deal, um, and he does a pole drive. And it's justice. That's the idea. Terry Funk at this point takes pile driver and like spins 18 times around. And it's like one of his arms is twitching and shit. He's all over the place. Does another pile driver. And Funk stands up and falls through the ropes. Terry Funk sells like Terry Funk and no one else. People have tried to do it. You know, not really how it works. 
Uh, he's trying to crawl away now. And at this point, Flair drags him back. And, like, he's trying to win because he's going for pins. But it's more a case of Flair, like, dealing, just dishing out punishment. Just just getting back what he feels was taken away from, which is months of his career. And, and it was framed on television as a potential career ender. So it's, it is heated stuff. And the audience is treating it that way, which is important. Um, Funk is just hanging tough at this point. He's getting his ass kicked, but every time they trace strikes, he tries to respond and then gets dropped anyway. Like, there's one great little portion where he rallies with the jab, and then boom, gets gets taken down again. Um, yes. Then, I believe Rick grabs the the figure four gimmick, and Gary Hart distracts the referee and Laren Terry to use the branding iron to cut the thing off, and it rules because it's basically represented that like. He's basically framed as though Ric Flair had the match won already. Like, he was just going to run through Terry Funk if he didn't cheat there. And that's a case of where Terry's selflessness really allowed him to be special in a time where guys didn't do that shit. You know, like, it's... He's a big deal, Terry Funk, but he kind of is always willing to be like, okay, we'll let... You know, Rick's Rick's obviously the priority here. We'll make sure that's the case. After the Brandon Iron, Rick has got color because, of course, he has. It's bleeding everywhere. And Terry now has a target. He starts throwing these... You know, punches to the to the cart he does the pole driver finally rick doesn't counter it uh, but rick gets his foot under the rope and funk is now like just in, he's lost it even more he's desperate he's pulling the ring mat up he's strangling rick all of the above he's playing as a pole driver on the floor which jim ross presents as being like an actual just death it's difficult like, it would have been the end of Eric flair but thankfully he back body drops himself free once more um, and at this point they do. There's this one wacky part where Terry's like just sort of falls on Ric Flair because of why not? Gets on the opening, just falls down. He's still selling. Sure, man, works for me. Middle aged and crazy, right? That's the deal. So um, Flair is selling the net by doing the thing where he just screams "Oh God!" a lot, which is always good Ric Flair stuff. Um, Funk is on the neck though, man. He's on the neck. He's hitting the neck breaker and he's screaming at Flair to quit. Which obviously, guys, I don't know if you if you fellas know where this is headed. It eventually leads to a very famous I quit match. So there's always this element of Terry being so disrespected by Flair in his own mind that he's seeking his approval more than anything else. And the result is he gets himself in predicaments where he can't even win the belt anymore. He's just trying to beat Ric Flair. Obviously, the you know, if he becomes the NWA champ, he gets all that respect and more, but he doesn't want that. He's lost in this conflict with Ric Flair himself. It's it's there's a, there's a great review of him from maybe Hamwork Reviews, I want to say. It talks about how that, that, that idea is kind of fascinating. That Terry Funk pushed things so far, he couldn't even win the belt anymore. He was just about to try to kill Ric Flair. Um, they do a little role reversal deal where Rick actually uses the brand and iron. And then he sends Terry head first in the post, and Terry gets color, which is neat. Um, what we got here. Uh, yep, then he does the punch in the corner, which Jim Ross hates, and it always pops when I see old legends doing it, or Jim Commons hates. Uh, but Terry's wily man. He evades him again. He goes spinning toe hold. Flair reverses. They trade, you know, Funk grabs a um, small package. Flair rolls it over, steals the pin. Steals the wrong words. Um, but, you know, he's framed as the fact, like, he, he kind of survived out of there. After having the match one early, he needed that, like, kind of um, quick pin here to just get out of there. And then there's a famous, very memorable brawl when Sousa's Mooter arrives, Sting arrives. They punch each other about 15 minutes. Flair cuts a promo where he... he kind of starts with a very sincere like you guys were privileged to be here for that which is neat because i think you know rick's had a lot of classics but i think he knows he has a lot of matches that are similar to each other this one kind of stands alone in its own lane of like babyface rick flair in a heated brawl he doesn't actually have many matches like that and terry funk's of a stature where he could make rick work differently put rick in a different scenario and i mean that's one of what reasons why this is like a, such a special part of his legacy we aren't reviewing the angle obviously but it is magic and it's worth watching as well as the match the match is a lesser... It teases... The best elements of this match are basically maximised in the I Quit match. And I think maybe what we'll do is... I, I was looking at what our main and co-main were here. And at some point, I'll put... Maybe the next show, or in a couple of shows, I'll put the rematch forward as my match. And someone has already suggested... I wish I remember the name. Someone suggested the sequel to Joe, AJ and Daniels. So we'll do that on the same on the same show. So we have some sort of rhythm here. It's, Joseph's, it's jo- WrestleMania Joseph's Match Monday. Exactly right. Um, I get what you're doing there, Backlash. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's a special match, folks. Right? And I, I really, listen, you guys know me. I'm not one for cheap plugs, okay? I would appreciate if you guys, if you do want to get the magazine, if you give that article a read. It's a pretty special one for me because the, the, this match and this feud is interesting because 
Ric Flair is 40. And people are making old jokes about Ric Flair. They think he's finished. Now, we all know how funny that is because he wrestles for another 20 years. But that's the narrative at the time. You know, he's 40. Terry Funk's 45. He's years removed from full-time competition, as I said. And it's these two legends that really, if we're being honest, on an objective scale, they're on a very, very small short list of guys that have genuine objective kind of qualifications for that GOAT that goat, you know, um, uh, credit. And here they are both extending their legacy and in the same time in a, in a memorable feud in a WCW that frankly doesn't have a whole lot else going on for itself. So it's a special time, a special program. Jeremy, since this is before your World Championship Wrestling grins, yeah, have you seen any of this stuff? I haven't, actually. I'm, I'm very, uh, like, late 80s WCW, complete blind spot for me. I just... I haven't watched a lot. Even like early '90s kind of stuff. Like like '93 is when I start to like really mm-hmm. pick up and where where I'm kind of familiar with stuff. But yeah, late '80s, early '90s, majority of the WCW stuff. WWE stuff I'm more familiar with because I, right. I just went back and, and watched that. Um, but yeah, the uh, that, that's a blind spot for me. That WCW stuff at that time period. Mm-hmm. It's a weird time because it's very much still. Like there's a lot of NWA left over there because it still is basically called the NWA, you know. So yeah. it, I think a lot of people lost on it. Uh, I, if you, you know, there's a lot of it that's not worth watching, guys. I would suggest if you're in a similar position to Jeremy, this these this feud and the Steamboat feud are the ones to kind of go for. True Colors said, um, "89 Flair might be the best year anyone's ever had." Steamboat trilogy and the Funk feud, exactly right. And and the best thing about that is the way it one pivots to the other, right? The Steamboat trilogy ends and Funk enters. It's it's perfect. Um, what else we got here? My earliest memory of Terry Funk is him and Foley getting thrown off the stage in a dumpster. It's a crazy thing, right? Crazy thing, that's a decade almost after this. <laughs> this seems strange to say, but unlike, unlike much wrestling, this thing looks like an actual damn fight. Yeah, that's Terry's art form, man. I mean, that's... He he obviously once was a much more traditional wrestler when he was the NWA champion work and stuff, but I think the, the real beauty of Terry Funk is when he's like this wild man. He's just great at that. Um... I think there's a decent chunk in the early 90s WCW you could miss. I mean, with WCW, it's always a case of, like, picking and choosing. Unless you want to be a completionist. Like, 92, the Dangerous Alliance stuff's worth watching. Everything else, no. 93 is just kind of... 93 is kind of shitty, right, Jeremy? Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of good stuff in 93. No. There's a lot of, there's a lot of shitty stuff out there, right? <laughs> um, okay. Folks, that was my match. Everyone can exhale now, because I've got my my ego stuff out of the way as we now go to one of the known Holbert haters in our world Jeremy which is the, the, the great jobber JJ who has who has outed me many times on TNA subreddits and forums <laughs> as a villain <laughs> as he's presented I thought it was a smart choice by JJ I would say that he's probably the most famous TNA match ever is that is that a hot take Jeremy Joe AJ Daniels, Unbreakable 05. Is this the most famous match in TNA history? No. Oh. Why would that oh. be a hot take? Oh, I thought you were saying no, it isn't. I don't know. I was wondering because I, I always get told I'm wrong about TNA being shitty, but this feels like a good take. I mean, right? TNA, TNA is shitty for the most part. Um, right. I agree, but people get upset at me. Yeah, fuck them. Uh, no, th- this is. I think this is the most famous match. I'm Cracker Jack says Kurt Joe. I don't know, man. Whenever people talk about TNA, like it always feels like this is the match that's referenced. Like I, I think yes. Kurt Joe leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth because of like how that storyline just mm-hmm. it eventually just all kind of kind of played together. I assume you're talking about like the first match, like the first big meeting. Maybe you're talking yeah. about the MMA match. I am Cracker Jack. Um, that's the problem. Do you don't think that's telling that in itself? Like these three have other matches, but everyone knows Unbreakable. Yeah. With with Joe and and Gango, it's like you remember them head but the head butt spot. Yeah. But match-wise, I think everyone's on a different plan. So, I, I think look, I think it's a good suggestion. But what I would say <laughs> is for sure, Sting and Hardy yeah, for reasons. Suggest- that's actually probably right. Yeah. <laughs> What's interesting is though, this is the last Unbreakable, as far as I know, which makes it even more like. I, I think yeah, that's wrong. I apologize, but it makes it even more cemented in history to me because it's like when anyone says TNA Unbreakable, you're never going to think of anything else, right? Like I think this is probably the only one they did. So of course it's that. Way. They did one. It's, I mean. It was an Impact Plus. They brought it back for Impact Plus in 2019. But I mean, I wasn't going to count that. 
but that does seem like a factor i think right like the idea that there's no other memories to kind of taint it like it's just unbreakable man that's that match joseph do you know what memory can taint the name of unbreakable i mean it's a sammy callahan main event against tessa blanchard good call good stuff guys <laughs> And little did they know that one would age. Um, yeah. I thought that was groundbreaking at the time. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway. Here's the thing with this match, okay? We have to be very, very sincere about what this is and not overcomplicate it. Because I can have a tendency to overcomplicate things, folks, if you haven't noticed in my hour and 15-minute review of four matches. One, one being a match with no human beings in it. Because here's the thing with this. It is basically... Two of the top five wrestlers in the world also wrestling a top ten wrestler in the world in like a twenty minute just like exhibition of cool shit they can do. That may sound like an insult. I can guarantee you it's not. It is literally a case of what TNA can do it could do it its best and still can, which is letting talented guys be talented. That's what this match is. Okay, so we'll go through the kind of ups and downs, but that in broad strokes that's what this match represents that's what it stands for it's an era of wrestling encapsulated with three guys at the height the, the peak of their powers basically physically anyway i know they, obviously two of them get a lot more popular later on but this is them all like physically peaked to me especially the two guys that i mean i love chris daniels but there's two of these guys are just outrageous yeah. anyway so early on those two guys joe and aj target daniels and there's this kind of Comedy is probably a bit of too strong a term. It's like a fun little element where Chris is just getting the shit down on both sides. You know, they're taking turns kicking him, and all of this stuff just looks incredible, man. Like AJ strikes in this match, dude. Just outright. AJ could just do anything, right? He's one of those guys who can do any style. Um, Joe in 2005, it can't actually be put into words by a dipshit like me. Just, just how much, like how spectacular Joe was at this point is almost. He's a cliche, and everyone goes, well, when he was in Ring of Honor, but it's like, it's absurd how good he is, right? Like, this is one of the great wrestlers ever at this point. He's, all of his stuff's hitting. He can move with anyone. He can outbrawl anyone. He's just, he's different at this time. And that's not to say from the other guys. It's just, they're all great, you know? Um, with Daniels slightly out of the picture, Joe and AJ go back and forth. They, their chemistry is obviously, you know, it speaks for itself. Um, and then Daniels comes back in. Now, this year, make it hard for me to make the notes out because there's a lot of, like, you go, I go. But one of the best things about this match is that it very rarely becomes WWE-style guy rolls out of the ring for a long time. Everyone always feels like they're in the match and in the shot, which is really, really neat in the sense that it's hard to do that without making it feel really, like... Um, kind of phony and, and forced and contrived. This never does. They're always transitioning from one thing to another and including everyone, which is very important to the match. I think it's why it blew it away so much. After earlier, where Daniel was again, he's asked kicked by both guys. He now returns the favour and gets both of his challenges at once. He is the champ of Oasis for the X Division title. Another reason it's a memorable match, folks, is it's the main event of a pay-per-view for the X Division title, which was very rarely the case. Should have been the case a whole lot more. Then again, maybe it just shouldn't have been for the X Division title. It should have been for the World Heavyweight title. <laughs> but I cannot rewrite history. Okay, it is what it is. So he's doing all that deal. Um, the, it's basically instead of being as I just is, it's not traditional in that sense. I think it's more common now, but at the time, it's like, dude, they're including everyone at almost every turn, which is very, very special considering how much shit you've got to fit in here, right? Like, and there's there's the one spot, for example, of this, where um, I believe Daniel's monkey flips AJ into a hurricane runner. It's like, it doesn't even feel contrived, does it? No. It looks perfect. Yeah. And it's a, it's a credit to the execution, it's a credit to the innovation, all that stuff. It's just a case of not taking the easy way out. These, these guys could have had a four-star match where they just did the thing where guys rolled in and out all the time. But they dared to do something different, and that's why I think it's so kind of enduring. Um, what have we got here? Yes, everyone's in the picture at all, uh, all times. Uh, what have we got? The famous dives, yes. AJ obviously does that absurd shooting star gimmick that they play all the time, and rightly so, because he's just he's a freak. Dude. I mean, that, the drop kick sequence that he does in every match ever, so, where he hits his taunt yeah. after... It's such a credit to how good he is that you pop for every time. It's so fucking yeah. smooth. I remember when yes. we when we watched whatever TNA watch along gimmick we did, like it's it's such a smooth sequence. Like it's just so good. 
and in, and in this point, he's so physical too. He's really like fired up and aggressive, which I think he still has. But it's combine that with the speed, and you have saying it's really like he hits Joe with his drop and you look at it and go, yeah, I believe he could drop Joe with that. You know, it's that kind of yeah powerful and intense. He just he's just, you know what he is, Drew. He's simply built different. Um, <laughs> okay, it's like and it's the best thing about AJ too is is. It's like the simple things that can pop me most, and he's always good at that. So like, yeah, he does that awesome spot out of the monkey flip, but he also takes a bump to the floor like a man possessed, just launches himself at the mat. He does everything with such vigor. You can't you can't help but be kind of immersed in what he's doing. There's there's a couple of great moments where Joe and um, where Daniels and AJ sort of try and trade strikes with Joe, and he just <laughs> just absolutely mauls them, like just lights them up with stuff. He does that here with Daniels and, and gets the choke on him quickly after. At this point, AJ breaks up the, the choke with the, uh, the 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 spiral. Is it the spiral tap? Spiral tap, yeah. Yeah, which is a very, very cool move. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, YouTube, it's very, very cool. It always looks like it kills guys, but it is very cool. <laughs> um, I said it earlier, but my notes have, have pointed to me again. It's like, I can't, with my words, capture how hard AJ is hitting people in this match. Like, it looks almost absurd how he's whacking guys with kicks and punches. Like, he's so fired up to steal this show, man. It's, it's tremendous stuff. Hello. Um, and again, I, I don't want to make it sound like he's fell off because he hasn't. It's just a case of this physically, this guy was, was absurd at one point. Um, then they, they go back to that earlier deal, right? Like, AJ's killing Daniels and Joe comes in and tries to do it himself. He's, there's this theme of sorts that Daniels is almost like a, like a victim. He's like a virtual victim at times. He's just he's just trying to survive because, I mean, he's a good fit for him because as great as he is, he's obviously not as, like, wow as the other two guys, right? They're astonishing. He's not. So it's a nice little kind of, not narrative, but it's a little thread that at every turn it feels like he's just getting hit from, from both sides. And, and you know those got Joe and AJ competing with each other, but they both take a lot of pleasure in beating up Daniels, which is neat. Um, every spot in this, again, I, I can call it a spot fest without being an indictment, because I think you guys know that I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying like it's a spot fest, but every spot is so perfectly placed and executed that it all feels very much natural. It's never hindered by the match's format, guys. You know how much I don't like triple threats, right? They're very limiting in the sense that you you're kind of painted into a corner as far as how you format it. This match throws that form out of the window. It, it, you know, it refuses to work within those limitations, basically. Joe and AJ do one of those strike exchanges of the ill cost somewhere earlier where, where Joe just just blisters him, like just lights him up, and it's, it's awesome. It is wild to think. For me, this is a happy ending. For some people, it might not be. But as I watch Joe and AJ, it is wild to me that these guys had a WWE title match at SummerSlam 13 <laughs> years after this. Like that's, that's insane to me. And I think it's pretty cool, personally. I like those matches, too. Very different, though. Very, very different look than these matches here. Um, now, something interesting happens here. So before we get to that, so Daniel gets the bell, and then Joe does that pass that I mentioned earlier, which is on the Alton scale. It's pretty, it comes in pretty damn high. Um, then Joe gets bumped to the outside, and AJ and Daniels are left. Daniels hits BME, Joe breaks up the pin, and then they get rid of Joe. And this is where I want to say, folks, that there were some issues in the match. The story goes that Joe forgot a whole portion of this match. And I would suggest it is around here because at this point there is a lot of talking. I mean a lot of talking. Pacing-wise, this part is the match is lol, which is hilarious because they do like a superplex and cool moves, but it's just less cool than the rest of it, so it's like the down spot. Joe appears... Like he's frustrated with himself. He comes in. He he, uh, he does like a you know big power bomb, trying to get some intensity back. But he, he gets the um, that spot he does, Jeremy. You know the deal where he goes from power bomb to STF, that whole thing. Yeah. He does that, and then I don't know if it's because I have my headphones up. Joe begins to just like just scream shit into Daniel's ear. Like <laughs> I'll do this. Feed me here. Like it's loud, real, real loud. And I had maybe my headphones up because I was trying to like you know just immerse myself in the match. But it, it, it's a thing Joe did a lot in this impact zone that I don't know why no one ever said to him, like, brother, there's 400 people there, you got to chill. Because he did it a lot. <laughs> and I love Joe, so I wouldn't say if it wasn't the case. Go. Okay? Um, has he returned your no, DMs? He has not. No, no. very sad. Um, now, it always fine, though, folks, because soon AJ decides, hmm, this thing may be getting out of hand a little bit. Let me do a torture wreck to some AJ and then slam him for two. You know, tremendous move, extraordinary stuff. An actual torture on the Samoan Joe at 260 pounds. 
That's generous. 280 pounds. He's incredible, folks. I haven't really more time to miss that. He then hits the Styles Clash on Daniels. Joe breaks it up. And then he's sent through the ropes. And that is the end of the Samoa Joe's presence in the match. Because then AJ and Daniels just go back and fall for, I'd say, 20, 30 seconds. Daniels goes to Angel's wings. He counters it. Gets that kind of... Um, the pin where guys would usually bridge, he just sort of hooks that for the win. What I said a minute ago is not a criticism. I actually think the match would have threatened to get like absurd if they'd have added, if they'd have included the other sequence they apparently intended to. But I do think it probably explains why Joe's like absence at the end is kind of frustrating. Is too strong a word, but kind of like oh, it feels like it feels like they could have done a better job of, of including him in the finish somehow. I don't know how you do it, but they did such a good job throughout the match. I, I would love to know what they had planned for the for the part they missed here because it's a, it's a it's like an all-time classic match. <laughs> so so it's kind of outrageous that this was like a lesser version of what they wanted it to be. To me, it's most special as... like And JJ may not like this, so I'm sorry, JJ. But to me, it's most special as kind of a what could have been, a what if, but also a what was. You know, and, and I mean, what I mean by that is it's definitely really cool that on national television these three guys had this platform. I think it's very important that we never ignore that TNA gave them that platform and they shined a light on, like, that style of talent, which I think is very influential now. But at the same time, it's very hard not to watch it and say, I don't know. I, I don't know if... I just don't know if Jeff Jarrett should be the NWA champ while this was going on, you know? It wasn't. Well, you, whatever, you know. Like, <laughs> I, I just... I guess I'm always left wondering what could have been, and I think it's a shame that they run this back four years later. It's, this does bum me out. They run this back four years later, and one month after that, Hogan's in, and it's like, that's the end, you know? I mean, I, I've often said that there was problems before that, but what I'm saying, guys, is when Hogan comes in, Chris Daniels is the top guy, is no more, <laughs> you know? Joe is the top guy, is barely anymore. AJ's Ric Flair now. Like, it's a real shame, and... That's why, to me, it's a double-edged sword kind of the deal. But even still, it's a special match that all three of these guys will be remembered for forever. I, I would assume, as much as I love Chris Daniels, I'd assume this is absolutely his most famous moment and match. The other two guys, obviously, it's more sort of complex than that because, you know, AJ ended up having WrestleMania matches with Shane McMahon and shit like that. He had, a, he had an incredible career. But it is... It's three of the great wrestlers of their generation being great. And, and two of them... Are basically physical anomalies. I mean, they're just outliers completely. They're they're ridiculous in this match. So, great match. I do. I would love to know what they had planned for that other sig, that other portion. But as as um as our friend Kanye West once said, I guess we'll never know. Not really your friend, Jeremy, right? What? When did? When did he say that? Do you remember when he was like, everyone was talking about what I'll say if I didn't win this award, and he raises the award and he's like. I guess we'll never know. It's his whole speech. That's great. You should, you should. <laughs> Jeremy, memories of this match? Uh, I haven't watched it in forever. Um, but, I mean, it's it's obviously very famous. It's very talked about. You mentioned it, but the dynamic that it's not one guy rolls out and they two guys just have a singles match and then they just rotate and everything. It's very much a triple threat match and they, they very much have... Uh, three-way spots and everything and like you said on the the hurricane rana spot like none of it looks contrived or anything like that it's just it's a very flowing match um i i should go back and watch because it has been so long that that i've seen it i didn't realize that joe forgot a portion of it and when that portion like actually kicks in and everything so now if i go back and watch it with those those eyes on it uh i wonder sort of you know where where i would see this match as but uh i think it's still really enjoy it yeah joe is like peak of his powers aj mm -hmm. is really peak of his powers in this match and daniels i mean shit he was like older then and he's still going like fairly strong now but yeah, he's, he's just great yeah, yeah he's still very very good so i need to go back and watch this because i remember loving it it's one of my favorite matches of all time it's just been forever since i've seen it it's worth noting um, it is on the YouTube for free, folks. So you okay. can you can tell them without the the benefit of Carl Anderson sending you an Impact Plus code. Um, I, I do want to say that that part with Joe is me guessing that's when it is because it isn't like if you if I didn't say that you would not know. 
you know? Right. But I've heard the guys talk about it, which is interesting. It just, it stood out to me because I, I knew that story, obviously. But if you didn't know, you would not think it. I mean, literally, the lull is a super bleak, and they just, like, chill for a second. Like, it's, it's, it's hardly like they break, things break down. Um, the crowd throughout. Yeah, so this is important. Don, Don West and the crowd are, like... They're, they're obviously important parts of TNA's legacy and all that good stuff. And people like Don. But, like, he's actually great when he calls these guys matches because he has such passion. But more than that, the biggest factor is the Impact Zone actually really loves the product at this point. Yeah. And obviously we know that that changes. And that's a shame because at this point, it is really something. Like, it feels... ECW is not the right comparison, but it has that kind of like they're all in on it. I guess Full Sail. You know when Full Sail was really rocking? Yeah. That's the perfect comparison, right? They're, they're having so much fun and, and like there's a there's real optimism to the whole thing, which is important also, which I think when we do the sequel, which from what I gather and what I remember is very good, it won't have the same, it won't have that zip because the optimism is not, you know, four years have gone, right? It's the way things are. But it's a special match, man. Special match, a special time for a promotion that if nothing else has left us with many tales to tell, you know, many, many a tale to tell. It's a very cool match. Um, I guess we'll chill here for a minute and see if the chat has anything else to talk about. Daniels was 33. Wow. It's not even old. It's wild, right? Yeah. Like, it feels like he was way older than that then. Interesting. I guess he can't have been. It was 16 years ago and he still wrestles. <laughs> <laughs> Should have figured it out myself. Perfect foil to the really... Yeah, exactly. Mike Tanay's whole thing is he's like the smart, analytical guy. So to have a dude with him that's just shouting and screaming, it's a good team, man. And like, look, I think sometimes people get carried away with how good it was. In matches like this, it's great because it's excitement. Um, I think I think there were... You know, JJ was concerned I was going to dunk on this match. By the way, the biggest compliment I could give this match is... How can you this was dunk an innovative... on this match? Like, hmm? how can you dunk I'm an on asshole. this match? Fair. It's an innovative match that's aged well, which is a much harder thing to do than people realise, you know? Because, like, guys have done this, they've tried to do this match since, clearly, like, <laughs> very influential match, and he still doesn't come across like saying that you've seen a million times. Which is very neat. My God, JJ's given drinking scoops. Drinking scoops? Talking about A1 being over because he slammed cold beers with the boys. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen those those uh, those jokes from our pals in wrestling Twitter, Jeremy? About the boys that would smash cold beers in the parking lot? I have, yes. Very good stuff. Um, anyone that hates... Anyone that dunks on this hates wrestling, exactly why you should have been concerned I was going to dunk on this. <laughs> um, that's a great match. Now, I, I do want to, but I don't think I have it here. Hmm. I was going to try and figure out when the next one is was so I could give you guys more time to watch the matches, but I do not have the document here, which is very sad. Um, when I get it, I will I will post it, folks. Well, it's been an hour and a half, Jeremy Lambert. Are you excited for Raw tonight? <laughs> Are you watching that shit? Are you not watching Shayna Baszler as she heads to the playground? No. Uh, I think I'm going to watch uh, the Brett doc with the EP, Big Brett Hart Mark. Mm-hmm. I actually didn't even watch that, I feel. Yeah. Um, Iron Cracker Jack, you can literally put your suggestion in the chat and I'll write down. You feel free. You can also, folks, while we're live, you can do it, because then I'll see your subscription thing. If not, if you're on the Patreon, do it there via direct message. If you're not on the Patreon, then can you, like, send it in my DMs, but with, like, some sort of proof of subscription? I don't want to have to do that, but, like, I don't know everyone's subscriber situation so I'm, I miss these things okay I don't know how easy it is either guys to prove that you're a subscriber so if it's really hard just don't I don't, I don't care okay so we got my god Mox and Regal Mox and Regal okay oh my god. okay cool I'm waiting on the Iron Cracker Jack folk Bucks win game 2 they need to Harden went out after a minute. They got shit kicked out. I, I think they win game two. I was talking to my friend about this. Um, yeah, it's not a good look that you lose to the the Nets without James Harden. Dude, they just shot poorly that game, right? Like, you're going like four for 30-something from three. A rough game for Middleton and Holiday. Like, I, don't, I don't feel like their game plan was, like, terrible. It's just... Because everyone's going to be like, oh, they should have pounded the paint more and everything. Like, you can't do that every single trip, you know, especially because the Nets 
they're going to shoot their threes. Like there's just going to be a difference in, uh, you know, it's, it's three against two right there. The Nets are going to shoot threes. So you can't go and just try to get buckets on the paint the entire time. I do think they should do that a little bit more, especially if the three is not falling. But you got to hit some threes at some point. And they just weren't hitting any. And they're a good three-point shooting team. Um, so you just got to trust that guys are going to shoot better in game two. Yeah, Cracker Jack mentioned it. Like, dude, regardless of, like, their game plan and their poor shooting, uh, like, Bud's rotations just suck. Like, they're, they're horrible. They sucked last season in the playoffs. They, they sucked this season. Like, you've got to, like... You gotta play your guys forty minutes. You gotta play your top guys forty minutes. So there's, there's no keeping them fresh. You can keep them fresh for it. it's it's stupid. But I think they win game two. Ah matter ninety nine has just suggested I watch an hour long Iron Man match. You do that, Joseph. and the the rules are that I have to say yes to the suggestion. So yes, I will review that match. Wow, wow, great. Let me know when you're gonna watch that because I can just like, I feel like you're not gonna you're not gonna have much in the tank for whatever else we do that week speaking of such i think bob and i are watching a tna pay-per-view this week <laughs> so we'll see it we'll see if that injures me again and i miss games stay on the stay on the end of the bench oh I'm playing with Rob. i need you for sunday or for thursday whenever our stupid show is uh because i have no idea what we're talking about on thursday nxt we're gonna Andrade. preview nxt in your house I'm glad you mentioned it, folks. I'm reviewing that next Monday. What? NXT in your house. Oh, that's right. You, we are reviewing that. Are we reviewing against all odds as well? Yep. That's the thing I knew was happening. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> of course, man. This is what we do here now on Mondays. You guys know. More TNA. JJ, you can see. I feel like JJ has given me other suggestions, but if not, you can do it. You can, if you have, you can do it. I don't mind. Um... It'll take me time to get through them all, folks, because we do we actually have to feel like eighteen pay-per-views a week now because everyone has a pay. Like I could have done the NWA this week, but obviously I, you know, you and guys why, know why. Why would that. we review the NBA and NBA NWA uh, pay-per-view? I reviewed it on the Patreon. If you want to read my review of the NWA pay-per-view, go to that. Joseph's review would have been very similar, probably slightly better. Like, we, you don't need to go in depth about. These stupid matches with their dumb finishes and their no storyline having asses. Sorry to hear that. Joe, did you see Jordan Oliver and Tony Dippin's two hour Iron Man match? No, I read the funniest review ever about it, though. I remember that review. <laughs> I'll share that. Maybe I'll share that. Yeah, that one was good. <laughs> um, where was that? In fact, if you just type, I know this is like lunatic behavior. If you just type my, like, at and then put Jordan Oliver, I'm pretty sure that'd be the only tweet I've ever seen about Jordan Oliver. <laughs> so you could just yeah, find it, because I don't know where, I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, is Kenneth losing the belt this weekend? No. No, I don't think so. Huh? To who? Moose. Oh, is that this weekend? Moose. Remember this, Jeremy? Have you ever done this with Moose in a uh, crowd? I've never. Yeah, does he still do that? I don't know. I mean, the crowd hasn't he been there. Do. For a very long time, so you should consider doing this again. Good stuff. I think he's more serious though. He's a wrestling god now, isn't he? Real, real quickly, I guess. I don't know. I don't watch Impact. Sorry. Um, it's a triple threat. Hang on, is it a triple threat? We should know what's on the card before we go any further. Because I'm just I'm going to review this shit. And I, what am I getting myself into here? Is it? I don't. Know. I got the card right here. Um, no, it just says Omega and Moose. Okay. Anyway, what was you going to say? Um, are we going to talk about AEW on? Thursday, like I feel like we're, yeah. well, are we are. Sure, it's Andrade, right? Are we going to talk about more than Andrade, or is it just Andrade? Should we talk about AEW's dying? <laughs> it's not unless it changes Anna Karana, like unless it changes this week. It's not Moose and Callahan. I will say, Callahan is not on this card as of right now. So sorry to hear that. There's. I guess there is a chance it will be Moose and Callahan. Um, but at, at least as of right now, it is not. I have to say, when I look at that NXT card, I don't know what's on the rest of it. I know the top two matches. There are a few things that better capture my feelings on NXT than the good of Raquel Gonzalez versus Ember Moon, followed by a five-way match. Five? 
Why five, man? Could you not do like one singles and a triple threat? Do you have to do five? You got to talk about a ball rap match, main event, and a main. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk. I want to talk about this, and maybe we'll get into it more on the main show if you want to. But like, right. we talk about it a lot. How AEW they only do four major events a year, and so like there should be a build to these four, and it should be a blow off on these four. And it's like they're just continuing every feud coming out of this show. And I don't like yeah. that at all. That's a new thing, though, right? I mean, they, they kind of did it coming out of... Uh, Revolution was the last pay-per-view. I guess they didn't like fully continue, like Mox and Omega. They, they kind of steered right. that in a different direction. Um, I don't remember what else is on Revolution. So, a common... This is interesting, okay? So, I agree with you completely. I thought it was really like eye rolling by the end of the show like oh they're doing this more too but what's interesting is i don't know about revolution but the pay view before that i remember it being a dialogue about like man someone needs to tell tony khan he doesn't have to just end everything like flat because he does that sometimes too right where it's like they just never talk about each other like it's done it's finished feuds in like for example cody and mjf yeah but unless i'm mistaken guys they just stopped that was it at the end but then this was like the complete opposite where every few felt like it got an extension. Like even ones you didn't feel like needed it. Ethan and Scorpio coming out. It's like, yeah, I don't know. It really gave me the vibe. I know that this is a really lazy excuse, but it did give me the vibe of just, we need to just fill out this, this next little few weeks, you know, like this, you know, this yeah. extend. So then we can start fresh. Like the pay-per-view cycle starts when we're back live. Do I like that necessarily? No. It gave me that vibe though. I've got to be honest. I mean, that's fair, and maybe that's that's what it is. And, like, I'm not even sure I totally blame them on that because they're on these Friday night shows. Clearly, people ain't tuning in to, at least live, not to see them. I do I do think that uh, people are watching replays and DVRs and everything, but live, like, people aren't, aren't, aren't watching the shows right now. Um, so I, I can see that. It's just, I don't know. I, like, we talked about it with the buildup, and how sometimes it didn't feel like oh these are built to make it feel like it's the culmination of everything and then so then they're just gonna even the ones that did feel like it was the culmination it's like well we're just gonna continue a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. and it is like every single feud almost it, what like what yeah. out of revolution was like solved here am i missing something or not revolution double or nothing was well, like I, solved i think those problems are like they feed each other where it's like the feuds don't feel like they were supposed to end yet because they didn't feel like they'd ever really started. So, yeah. You know? So it's, it's so that's not saying you're wrong. What I'm saying is, is that kind of puts more credence to what our original complaint was. These feuds feel kind of undercooked. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard because I think Dynamite, and I think history will show this, Dynamite has probably had the best in-ring run of any wrestling television show in the history of US wrestling. Right. And people may laugh at that, right? But guys, listen, I love old school wrestling. It wasn't trying to give you good matches. But I do think we can get lost sometimes in those good matches when it's like, it would be nice if there was more engaging stuff on the TV. Like, for for example, I know that Brit and Nyla is going to be good. That was a shitty segment they did yeah, on Yeah, that Wednesday segment sucked. Or Friday. And just because the match is good doesn't mean the segment was good. But do you see what I'm saying? So it's like, I think Tony's shown a real ability to match make. Like an old school book in the sense that he goes, okay, this is the logical next step. Nyla beat Brit in the tournament. We go this way. His ability to find interesting ways of getting there, I do not think is always particularly strong. Now, that doesn't mean he's a bad booker. That means he's a wrestling booker with pros and cons, right? But some of that stuff was just like, and like, the inner circles thing was just like, we're not done yet. It's like, oh my God, how flat is that? So it's... Well, get it's, ready, because um, the pinnacle is back this Friday, Joseph. See, yeah, I, I don't know. I I think it can be a little rigid at times in the way it sets these things up. It's like they have their playbook, right? Like, so they'll do a brawl and they'll... I understand it's wrestling, but some of it feels really just like cookie card to get to the match, which is their priority. And I don't think it has to be that way. I think you could probably puts out to get better then noella knocks the burgers up in the air that was a, that was a weird segment and like you're right like nyla beat her in the tournament that's the reason to do the match right. you don't have to heal on a heel you know like Ny- nyla comes off like brit's already being a dick 
to the crowd. Is Nyla the baby face now? Because she ruined the yeah. heel segment, even though she's always been a heel and like hasn't done. It was just an odd segment that, yeah, it didn't come off well and was just unnecessary. And So, look, I, I know we're supposed to say this first, but it's just all about, I guess, like, where's your... Here's my thing with Andrade, okay? Because I think this is important. I mean, if they get an execution better, the rest of the show's weaknesses get covered over a bit more. I didn't think it was as bad as some people did. My take on it would be, it was like the Miro one, where it's just like, oh, it's fine. It's flat. Yeah, it was just flat to me. Do you... Where do you stand on him and Vicky? I get, like, why you would want to put him with, like, a mouthpiece. I don't think Vicky is like that mouthpiece because she's just doing her WWE shtick, right? Like she's yeah. just doing the excuse me. She's not even like super established as like an AEW manager. Like she, she's like right. with Nyla, but they've done nothing with that partnership. Like absolutely nothing. Um, it's, it's just, yeah, I get why you want to pair him with somebody. Cause it feels like they pair everybody with somebody, even good promos and Andrade, I mean, he's, he's been limited in his promos. Maybe he's good. But the English is always going to be something where it's like, all right, how how big can he be on the mic in, in this uh, in this company? Uh, so I get why they want to pair him with somebody. I just, I just don't know if Vicky Guerrero in 2021 is like the guy. Yeah, Anna Crowner mentions Abrahantes. Like, that's good. But then you're, you're pairing him with Penta and Phoenix, which, I mean, maybe he wouldn't mind. I don't know. I just... I feel like he's a case of a guy that doesn't... And I say this someone that loved the act with Zelina. Like, Zelina was awesome, but he just looks like such a star. Yeah. I'd be really tempted to just, like, just do pre-take promos, subtitle him when he wants... Like, he could he could say a sentence in English and the rest could speak Spanish. You know, like, I don't think it'd be a problem. I think he could be... And this is why I didn't sweat the debut, because I'm so confident in him as a talent. I think you know that, right? Yeah. This is not me doing revision. It's like, I think yeah. the world of him. And I think as soon as the bell rings, he'll quickly establish himself as a top, top guy. I just... I hope they realise, and I mean this with much respect and love to the rest of the guys on the roster, I think they need to realise this guy is actually... He could be something different. And with Vicky, you immediately make him a very, like just another wrestling act yeah and i do not think he needs to because to me when he says that shit we know where he goes i used to say i was the face of latinos it's like dude he's i mean this this not is this not mess this up or or kind of confuse this he could be a game changer for that audience like, i mean i mean that because he's already famous as, as he's a, he's lucha lawy rawy not lawy <laughs> no need for lawy when you get make big bucks so he's, <laughs> but yeah, he's lucha royalty and the idea of a guy like him being a top guy is very different, right? I and mean, we know what Rey Mysterio represents. But he is... Rey is the ultimate luchador, right? Like, you know, the mask, the presentation. Andrade is a guy who, like... Who do you compare... When you see him, you're like, oh, my God, he could be what Nick Aldis wants to be as the NWA <laughs> champion of today. That's why I always used to think. When, when NXT was sort of the default alternative to main roster because we didn't have any other major league wrestling, really, I often would say to people, like... Yeah, look, you got Roman or whoever being WWE champ. Andrade's the, the equivalent to what Flair was for those guys back in the 80s. He's like, he feels like a real, like, sports star. You know, like, he's got the suits, he looks incredible, he carries himself a certain way. And I just think, this ain't a guy that you make any other wrestling at, man. This is a guy that can, like, can be a real celebrity. I really believe that. You know, and I think the whole, the, just the way he, he acts, the way he carries himself, I think he could be special, man. Like, Someone mentioned here uh, about Anra, whose name I will not say because it's very scary. Andrade's entrance at TakeOver with Gargano, like that, that's what I mean. Like that kind of deal. I watched that and think this guy could actually be like a cultural figure. Now, I am obviously very uneducated on Mexican wrestling, so I think he's already a huge deal with fans of, you know, actual Mexican wrestling fans that watch Lucha. I get it. But it is a big deal when a guy goes to America and makes it big, big, right? Yeah. He's already done a good job. He's had a very good run in WWE. Especially with the NXT stuff, but it's like, man, he feels like someone that's got absurd star potential to me. And is Vicky the one to unlock that? I think I'd rather him just be him. So it's difficult in that regard. I'm not sure. I'm I'm totally with you on again, I don't 
maybe they don't trust him on the mic. I thought what he delivered on Friday was good. You know, short. Mm-hmm. There wasn't there wasn't too much to it, but I still thought it was good. Like you said, you can mask these kind of things. Um, I I just the Vicky pairing is just weird because she's not like super established on AEW. I'm not even sure like her character is like that good considering she's doing just the same shit she did years ago and it's just like grating and it wasn't good then like i guess i guess it generated some heat you know 15 years ago however long ago it was but like it's just not good yeah i'm you're right i i don't think she's the person to really unlock that and if they if you don't have the person to unlock that then just let him be on his own and let him kind of sink or swim with that that whole deal i like the miro comparison of like all right it was flat and it certainly was like the crowd made no sound when yeah when his name got mentioned by her and they got a little bit uh louder when he came out and everything but compared to like what you uh like what you wanted it to be it certainly wasn't that right like the crowd did not make it come off like it was a big thing and then jim ross is saying his name wrong and shit and that doesn't help anybody um <laughs> <laughs> it's worth noting by the way that a decade ago when Dolph was with Vicky the take was Dolph needs to get away from Vicky because she's a prelim act and he needs to become a top guy and it's like hey man I don't know <laughs> I don't know if you want to I don't know if you want to be doing that shit 10 years later yeah but I, I don't the thing with AEW is they do have my faith in the sense that I don't sweat this stuff like yeah I feel like if it objectively sucks they're paying him too much money to pretend otherwise. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I feel like they'll quickly realize we need to. And I also agree with Northwood that it could be a red herring. Uh, you know, I think it could be. It still wouldn't be. It's not the ideal first impression. I'll say this much. I love Miro. Andrade is much better. So he's much more likely to get over immediately than Miro because he's. Miro is a great worker. Andrade is like. Like absurd. You know, like if you put him in there with Matt Seidel on television. He will blow people away. Yeah. And this is a guy that can do... We talked about... We were reviewing their matches earlier. We talked about AJ could do anything. Andrade can do any style. He's so special. So I have no concerns, really. I just... It's not my ideal. But I get it. I, I understand... Uh, I understand kind of the, the idea behind it. I just don't love it, personally. I think, you know, we'll criticize AEW for three, four, five, six months and be like, wow, they're wasting Andrade, they're wasting Andrade, they're wasting Andrade, and then six from months from now did you tweet it like i can't wait to see andrade against hangman for the title yeah. at, at i'm pretty confident of that too i'm like, pretty confident of that like yeah i think i think it'll get there and then it'll be like mm-hmm. oh yeah andrade is a big star i yeah aw's earned enough trust where it's like all right maybe the initial thing won't be like super great or whatever they got a lot of people on the roster a lot of people to take care of but they'll figure it out and they'll get there and we'll look back and be like all right you just gotta have a little patience with the, See, with these this things. is the, like, guys. I understand for those of you watching this that you might be thinking, "Well, what's the point of talking about it on Thursday?" I, I think look, we can we can discuss it, but I actually think this was a really interesting statement as to where the industry's at. In that, like, <laughs> like bless them, Ring of Honor had so many advantages here, and it seems likely he'll never work a date for Ring of Honor at this point. And he may have in his deal to R H. Okay, it would not surprise either of us, right, Jeremy, if he never worked there, right. I think that's a real telling moment regarding like where these promotions are at in terms of their position on the on the ladder. And I think if we didn't learn already from the way AEW handled the impact relationship, where it was just like they basically treated them like they were a promotion in another country, right? It's like yeah, Kenny does that stuff over there, <laughs> you know, like we borrow a guy and that's it. I think this was telling in that regard, and I think it's interesting when the free agency pool is, is as it is. And it's worth talking about, like, what if this is the new reality, how does AEW go without signing all these guys? Which, again, we'll, we'll try and get into on Thursday, because I do think it's very interesting. Um, people ask, in the chat are asking about Shingo winning the title. Joseph, do you, like, even watch New Japan anymore? No, I didn't. I didn't I'm glad. I mean, I, I'm more likely to watch it with him as champ than Okada. I mean, I love Okada, but it's, you know, you've done it 101 times. I, I've always called cool, Eddie. I didn't expect it. Fresh choice. I can't. I didn't watch the match, so I can't comment on that, but good i think it's the right um direction right fair to say yeah i was up i watched it um i'm not a match guy but i enjoyed the match uh and i do like shingo as the champion because it is something different it is something fresh where okada just would have been like okay it's cool you can count on okada it's good but 
Uh, I thought I thought Shingo he deserved it. I'm glad he got it. And now it seems like they're gonna shut up, set up, shut up, uh, set up Shingo and Osprey again. Whenever Osprey gets back, I would imagine Shingo's keeping that belt until Osprey gets back. And then you know Osprey defended the title against them. Technically, can be the one who was like, I took you out of action. Uh, type deal made you vacate this title if that's the story you want to tell and you do that match so i like it i like shingo he's 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 tremendous and then you can also do shingo and naito at some point if naito can kind of hold up yeah he, he called out abushi they'll do that i think shingo beats abushi i don't think they're going back to abushi as quickly yeah i just laid out what i think they're going to end up doing with shingo but of course your japan's been weird for the last year and a half now so abushi might just fucking beat him yeah, it does feel like a sort of crossroads of sorts. I feel like I need to hit with this one. You know, don't mess this up. Don't overcomplicate it. Let Shingo have some classics. Yeah. Sierra does give him a chance to, to succeed business-wise. And uh, I think that, again, I, I don't know where I'm at in terms of my interest. is like they just kind of killed me off. But I'm, I'm more likely to be back in now, which is a good thing. That's a positive step. So there you go. I'm not buying any of this Omega stuff until, like, we actually... One, until, like, the world opens up a little bit more, at least Japan. Because, I mean, America, it seems like it's fairly open. But Japan is still, like, not open. And I don't think they're sending Shingo to America. I think it's got to be Kenny comes to Japan. Right. That would be big business, I guess, right? So, oh, I, yeah, Japan? I mean, it makes some yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody, we're going to wrap up. Um, back tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Big show tomorrow. This is bullshit. <laughs> what? This is the most ridiculous thing. Like you're actually, you've actually booked this show. Like what the fuck? <laughs> what? What are we even? Are we going to do a four-person roundtable about the Mighty Ducks? Yeah. <laughs> what? I don't know. Why not? Like, what's the what's the conversation? Like, yeah, that was a good one. I liked one. I liked two. We're going to talk about series. how good these these players are. We're going to talk about who's overrated. I got some takes on this stuff. Joseph. Oh no! I, do I, I don't have to know what's going on, do I? Not really. Can I just sit in the corner and spot up? That's fine. That's fine. Okay, good. I feel I feel like Jensen and SP3 are gonna like really carry yeah. carry this one. They're, <laughs> They're gonna fired. be at your element, Donnie. Dude, they're they are fired <laughs> up to talk about this, like legitimately. <laughs> have you seen their tweets, Joseph? SP3 is no. like I do I do this podcast and that podcast. I don't look forward to any podcast more than I'm looking forward to this one. And Jensen's like, I talk about wrestling all the time. Jensen, crazy person, would stay up until 3 a.m. on Fridays to watch the game, new Game Changers. Like, they are they are fired up for this one. This is one where, like, you know, we, we, let, the, we let the men come off the bench. We let the role players just take over. We're having an off game, maybe. Memphis Reggie comes in, and he just – Blake – Blake Griffin reverts back the clock, and we just let them go. We ain't got to do much. I'm terrified of this show because <laughs> I, I know I'm out of my depth, and I just don't. I mean, I watched them recently, so how bad can it be? But it's just like, you're going to be talking about like the players, like the real piece. Very scary. <laughs> Very scary. I don't know. It'll be fun. I'm sure it'll be fun. That's the, I hope so. That's tomorrow at three, everybody. Mighty Ducks talk. We're going to talk game changes. We're going to talk the trilogy. Myself, Joseph, SP3, Steven Jensen. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. You know, Joseph, we can, uh, we can, what do we do? We can do a watch along instead. We can watch bad wrestling instead if you want. No, it's okay. fine. I'll just sit and, I'll just sit and watch. It's fine. <laughs> We're going to raid Mega Ran. He's playing No Mercy. So it seems up. Oh man, he's got a cool mod. He's playing an AEW mod too. Very nice. I like that. There we go. Tremendous. Yes. All right, check out Mega Ran. Tell him we said hi. Tell him what's up. Y'all have a good night. Enjoy Raw. Don't actually watch that. You know, watch something better than that. But y'all enjoy y'all's night. We'll catch y'all tomorrow.